Record of Votes and Proceedings of the National Assembly sitting of Monday, 15 March, 2021. Thank you, Clark. Honorable Members, Records of Votes and Proceedings of the National Assembly sitting of Monday, 15 March, 2021 is before us for correction and approval. Can any Honorable Member please move that the said records of votes and proceedings be considered and approved. Any member who wishes to? Honorable member for Lower Salu. Well? Lower Salu. Or oh, Sabah Sanjal. Honorable member for Sabah Sanjal. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, and good morning to everybody. I rise to move that the record of votes and proceedings of the See. National Assembly sitting on Monday, 15 March, we consider that and adopt it. So this was. It has been seconded. Any seconder, please. Honorable member for Nyani. Thank you. I rise to second the motion. Thank you. It has been moved and seconded that the records of votes and proceedings of the National Assembly sitting of Monday, the 15th March 2021, be approved. Any issue, observation from honorable members? Hmm? Starting with page one. The records, page one. Any issue, any observation? No issue, we move to page two. Page, page one. Honorable page one, yes. Yes. Uh, statements by the honor, honorable ministers. Instead, statements, statement. And ministers, minister. Number four. N noted. Any other observation? Honorable member for Woolley East. Thank you, honorable. Uh, you know the statements by, it's, it's the caption. That is the caption. Statements by ministers is the caption. It should always be there. It could be two ministers, three ministers, but that is the caption that's, that is there. It's okay. Page okay. oh. two. Page two, any issue, any observation? <coughs> Yara East. Yes, thank you, Honorable Speaker. Um, page one, oral ministerial statement on the implementation of the monitoring of the annual budget. This was never made, Honorable Speaker. I think it should be indicated. Thank you. Noted. Any observation from any honorable member? We go to page three, attendance. Savas Sanjal? Yes. Uh, let me take you to number 16 and 21. I, I don't think those people were present yesterday. Thank you. Honorable Chair, can I take you back to number page two? Uh, if you look at page two, the establishment of the parliamentary frenzy between Morocco and Gambia, that one was withdrawn. It was not adopted. Hmm? This is the order paper. Okay. That is the order paper, but in, it, 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 it's been withdrawn, captured. Then we go to page three, attendance. Any... Issue? Yes. Sanjali, yes? Yes, let me ratify it. It's page two, it's number 21. I was made to understand 16 was here. Honorable member for Latir Kunda. He was here. No, he was yes. here. He was here, yes. <laughs> yeah. 
note it. We go, to, we go to page four. Page four, please. Page four. Any issue, any observation? We go to page five. Page five. Sebastian yes. Yes, page five, second to last paragraph. Um, let me just read and put my correction there. Honorable Speaker informed the Assembly that the Honorable Minister of Finance, it should be for finance, instead of, of four. And I will... Honorable Speaker. Yes, please. Yes. Um, yes. Honorable Speaker, I think is um, off and not for. Exactly. And if you look at when they are making their abbreviation, normally they use O and not F. So is Honorable Minister of Finance and not for finance. <coughs> Noted. Thank you. We move to page six. Page six. Bundunga Kunda, on page six. Yes, thank you. Um, I think the year mentioned um, all over is 2020, when it should be 2021. Like uh, number three, at the end of the sentence, sitting of the Tuesday, 15 December 2020. Yes. Yes. Um, it goes on to the the next paragraph too. Almost at the end of the. Year. Correct. Okay. Noted. Thank you. Page seven. Page seven. Will the east. Yes. Uh, page seven. The last paragraph. Uh, first line, the Honorable Speaker granted the request, however cautioned. We should put but. The Honorable Speaker granted the request, but, however, granted. That's how it should go. Noted. Any other observations? Page 8. Cantora. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker. I think uh, they are right. Uh, I mean, the, the issue, we are reporting what transpired last sitting, that is in December. Yes. So the record here is correct. It should be 2020, yes. not 2021. 2020. Thank you. No, the, thank you. Any other observation? We go to page nine. Page eight. Nyanija. Yes, pick it. Uh, question under the paragraph, question put and agreed to. If you, uh, let me just read because if not, you don't understand. It has been moved and seconded that this Honorable, Honorable Assembly do consider the agreement between the Government of the Republic of the Gambia and DCAF, so and so, Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance, for the establishment of DCAF office in the Gambia. It seems like it should be field office because that's what is on the other other paper, as how it is mentioned. And wheresoever it appears, you put fill there. Thank you. Thank you. Noted. You go to page nine. Page eight. Honorable member for Woodley East. Yes. Yes, thank you. The last paragraph, first line, it says, at this juncture, the Honorable Speaker invited Honorable members. We put ED on the wish, who wished to take part because we are reporting, it's in the past. Who wished to take part? Put ED there. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Noted. Honorable Member for Jara East. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Uh, on the motion, be it resolved that this August Assembly do stand adjourned. The August will be in the capital, 
be it resolved, is in italics, or in capital letters. Thank you. Page eight, yes. On the motion five, be it resolved that this August assembly, the August, the F will be in capital. August assembly do stand, consider and ratify. You see? Thank you. Pig nine. Pig, pig nine. Pig ten. Yani, yeah, pig ten. Yes, uh, pig ten. Uh, is this sentence before Kekson put and agreed to? Where you have the honorable member for Fony Berefet seconded, and it should be spoke on the motion. Then if you go to the ensuing debate, you remove his name there. You start with Honorable Neyaz and Seka as number one. Thank you. Noted. Any other observation? Page 11. Page 12. Page 13. Page 10, taking us back to page 10, honorable member. Yes, page 10. Yes, honorable Speaker, I am on record for always highlighting this error. If you go to page 10, it says, be it resolved, all in lower cases, small letters, for the purpose of consistency, we have to adopt one. Thank you. Page 13. Page 14. Will the East? Page 14. Thank you. Page 14, the first line. The same situation occurs there. Suleiman. Who wish to partake? You put the ED there. And it's in all the other pages. Noted. Page 15, Nyanija. Yes, a minor one. Ensuing debate, my name, I seconded the motion and spoke on it, so no need to put my name on the ensuing debate list. Thank you. Noted. Page 16. Page 16. Page 17. Honorable member for Woolley East. Yes, page 17, where it is said, uh, be it resolved, that this August Assembly do stand adjourned. We put an ED there. You've seen that. And then the paragraph before that, at this juncture, the Honorable Speaker thanked, thanked E.D., everyone. You've seen that? Yes. Noted. Thank you. That's the last piece. Hmm? It has been moved and seconded that the records of votes and proceedings of the National Assembly sitting of Monday the 15th March 2021 be approved with amendment. Those in favor, please say aye. Those not in favor, please say no. Then the ayes have it. Clerk. Laying of papers and reports. The report of the Joint Committee of Public Enterprise and Environment and Sustainable Development and NGO Affairs on the Petroleum Commission Bill 2020 by the Honorable Chairperson of the Joint Committee. Thank you. Right.
Honorable members will recall that the motion for the second reading of the bill entitled to Petroleum Commission Bill 2020 was moved by the Honorable Minister of Petroleum and Energy on Friday the 17th July 2020. The motion was seconded and debated on the general merit and the principle of the bill. Ensuing accordingly, thereafter the bill stood referred to the Assembly Business Committee for committal to ABC on the said bill, to the Joint Committee on PEC, Environmental and Sustainable Development and NGO Affairs for scrutiny, for further scrutiny, and report back. The committee today is scheduled to table the report the rep its report before the Assembly. Once the report is tabled, the debate and adoption of the next stage of the bill, which, which will be considered, which will be considered accordingly at an appointed date. Yes. I will now therefore invite the Honorable Chairperson of the Joint Committee on PEC and Environment Sustainable Development of NGO Affairs to table the report of the committee. Co-chairpersons. Co-chair. Co Co hmm? yes. hmm? Honorable member of the Joint Committee Me member for M member for Jara East. Yes. Uh, thank you, Honorable Speaker. Uh, this joint report will be ably presented by Member for Serekunda on behalf of the Joint Committee. Honorable Speaker, you will recall that this report, the Petroleum Commission, was referred to the Joint Committees of PEC bill, rather. Thank you. This bill was referred to the Joint Committee of PEC, that is Public Enterprises Committee and Environment, Sustainable Development, and NGO Affairs for further scrutiny. And Honorable Speaker, the committee did justice. You'll come to know that as and when our presenter presented on our behalf. Without much ado, it is my pleasure, Honorable Speaker, at your request, to invite co-care, Honorable Sala, member of Sheriff Kunda, to present on our behalf. Thank you. Request granted. Honorable member for Seracunda, the co-chair, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, co-chair. Thank you very much, honorable speaker. We did work together with efficiency and effectiveness to prepare the report on time. Honorable Speaker, this is the report of the Joint Committee of the Standing Committee on Public Enterprises and the Select Committee on Environment, Sustainable Development and NGO Affairs of the National Assembly on the Petroleum Commission Bill 2020. Honorable Speaker, we did prepare the report taking into consideration format, which deals with acronym, content, the members who participated in the exercise, acknowledgement, introduction, mandate, methodology, proceedings, witnesses, scrutiny, evidence, consideration, and recommendation. We have annexes, Annex 1, rationalization, harmonization, validation, adoption, and presentation of the consolidated version of the Petroleum Commission Bill 2020. We have Annex 2, which deals with the minutes of the Joint Committee 
the Public Enterprise and Environment Sustainable Development and NGO Affairs. Honorable Speaker, the honorable members who participated in the exercise constitute Honorable Saini Ture, the co-chairperson, Honorable Halifa Salah, the co-chairperson, Honorable Alaji Jawara, vice chairperson, Peck, Honorable Yaya Gassama, member, Honorable Seku Marong, member, Honorable Swaibu Ture, force rapporteur, Honorable Momodu Kamara, member, Honorable Omar Sise, member, Honorable Salif Ujao, member, Honorable Bakari Njai, second rapporteur, Honorable Amadou Kamara, member, Honorable Madi MK Sise, member, Honorable Alaji S. Dabo, member, Honorable Mohammed Magasi, member, Honorable Usman Ture, member, Honorable Kajali Fofona, member, Honorable Keba K. Barrow, member, Honorable Mohammed Ndaw, member, Honorable Mumadou Kamara, member, Honorable Biram J. S. So, member. Honorable Speaker, point of correction. Yes. Uh, uh, Mumadou Kamara, uh, member. For Nyani? Yes, Momadu Kamara appears twice in the list. Is it? Eh? In the Honorable Nyani, Member. Is it observation or? Yes. Observation? Yes. What? I What's your, uh, yes. Honorable Member's list. Momadu Kamara's name appears twice. Observation. Mm -hmm. is, is Amadu Kamara and Momadu Kamara? No. Amadu is there, but Momadu also is there. Thank you very much, but those, those things can come afterwards. Uh, okay, for, uh, thank you. They can come afterwards, yeah. Noted. You, you will be uh, looking at the report. Yes. At the end. So and I will remember for Sarah Kunda, you can go ahead. Yeah, Noted. Take note of all observations, yeah. Uh, Honorable Speaker, we did uh, engage subject matter specialists, Dr. David Tommy, Justice Aminata L. Arangam, and Mr. Fode Bojan. The support staff, Madam Fatumata Keta, committee clerk, Lamin, Mr. Lamin Bamba, research officer, Mr. Modika Ba, research officer. Honorable Speaker, we, the members of the joint committee, wish to register our appreciation to the clerk of the National Assembly for providing the support staff that gave their best, as necessity dictated, to enable the joint committee to attain its goal. The subject matter specialists have had their inputs where and when necessary. The Minister of Petroleum and Energy and his team displayed tremendous commitment, consistency, humility, and professionalism in defending what is defensible while acknowledging all gaps matched by options to redress them. They were able to address all the concerns of the committee members and showed remarkable diligence in incorporating any recommendation that is fit for purpose. The Joint Committee is indebted to the witnesses who took the time to scrutinize the bill, clause by clause and satisfactorily demonstrated their competence, enthusiasm, professionalism, forthrightness, and objectivity in giving valuable evidence which enrich the report and the content of the bill. Honorable Speaker, the Fifth Assembly of the Second Republic, sitting on Thursday, 2nd July, 2020, during the third ordinary session of the 2020 legislative year witnessed the introduction of a bill entitled Petroleum Commission Bill 2020. On the second reading of the bill, dated 17th July 2020, the members debated on the merits and principles of the bill. At the conclusion of the debate, the Minister of Petroleum and Energy gave his reply. The question was then put for the bill to be read a second time, and the motion was carried. The bill was read for, for the, the second, second time and, and was referred to the Assembly, Assembly Business, Business Committee, 
for committal to the relevant committee committees as dictated by Standing Order 68. The Assembly Business Committee remitted the bill to a joint committee comprising the Public Enterprises Committee and the Select Committee on Environment, Sustainable Development and NGO Affairs of the National Assembly. The Joint Committee convened its inaugural meeting on the 5th of October 2020 to strategize and identify the way forward to fulfill its mandate as prescribed by Standing Order 69, 107, 108, and 109, which provide the procedural guidelines to perform its task. According to Standing Order 107, the Joint Committee had the option to allow one of the committees to dispose of the bill in accordance with Standing Order 108, or agree to sit concurrently in accordance with Standing Order 109, or propose the establishment of a joint select committee to carry out the task as provided under Standing Order 110. The question was put and the members chose to sit concurrently. The chairpersons of the two committees consulted and agreed to the principle of rotational occupancy of the seat of chairperson and vice chairperson throughout the performance of their duties as provided for understanding order 109 paragraph 3b. The meeting we are co-chaired by Honorable Saini Tude and Honorable Chairperson of the Select Committee on Environment, Sustainable Development and NGO Affairs and Honorable Ali Vasala, the Chair of the Public Enterprise Committee on a rotational basis. The Joint Committee considered it prudent to call the mover of the bill and his team as the first witnesses to provide evidence on the bill. It also charged the researchers with the task to gather more information regarding the acts governing the petroleum sectors in other jurisdictions for comparative analysis. The Joint Committee drew a list of relevant stakeholders deserving appearance before it to give evidence on the subject matter. On Tuesday, 6 October 2020, the Joint Committee held its first meeting with the mover to spell out the ground rules of the review exercise of the Petroleum Commission Bill 2020 by the Joint Committee. It was conveyed to the mover that the Joint Committee had the duty to, as prescribed by Standing Order 69, to examine the details of the bill clause by clause, take evidence, and gather proposals for amendments from relevant stakeholders, which will be shared with the mover for consensus building on an amended version of the bill, which will be in included in its report to the National Assembly for consideration. An understanding was reached that as the Joint Committee proceeds with the review process, proposed amendments will be conveyed to the mover for consideration. It was intimated to the mover that he had the duty to incorporate the amendments agreeable to him in the original bill. This would be followed by the preparation of a consolidated version of the bill by incorporating the proposal, proposed amendments for final review during rationalization, harmonization, and validation meeting aim at finalizing and building consensus on a version of the bill which, with its proposed amendments, that will be conveyed to the Assembly for consideration. After the inaugural meeting with the mover, the Joint Committee invited witnesses, gathered evidence, teased out the proposals for amendment, and facilitated the preparation of a final text of the bill incorporating all the proposed amendments. This report indicates the mandate of the Joint Committee, provides a summary of the evidence gathered from the witnesses, projects all the proposals for amendments, and attaches a text of the bill incorporating all the proposed amendments for easy reference by members in scrutinizing the bill clause by clause for approval or otherwise at the consideration stage. Mandate. In accordance with Standing Order 69, the mandate of the committee is as follows. 
A, identify witnesses, hold proceedings, and gather evidence on the clauses and schedule of the bill. Record the opinion of the committee on each clause and schedule of the bill focusing on any proposed amendment. C, present amendments in the order in which they stand in the bill. D, present a report comprising a summary of the evidence gathered from the witnesses, the opinion of the committee on the clauses of the bill, and the amendments proposed as incorporated in a final text with minutes and related documentary evidence attached. Methodology. The Joint Committee adopted the following methodology to gather evidence. A, call witnesses to testify. B, call for submission of documentary evidence. C, convene meetings to rationalize and harmonize proposals for amendments. D, convene meeting to validate the bill with proposed amendments. Proceedings. The Joint Committee engaged the following witnesses to gather evidence. Witnesses, Mr. Sanyam, Minister, Honorable Minister of Petroleum and Energy, Mr. Lamin Kamara, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Petroleum and Energy. Mr. Jere Barrow, Commissioner, Ministry of Petroleum and Energy. Mr. Kisima Bite, State Council, Minister of Justice. Mr. Momodu Yisar, Advisor to the Minister of Petroleum and Energy. Mr. Kaini Ture, Deputy Commissioner, Ministry of Petroleum and Energy. Mr. Lamin Fati, the Public-Private Partnership uh, uh, person at the Minister of Finance and Economic Affairs, Mr. Farmer Adabo, the Director, Ministry of Fisheries and Water Resources, Mr. Omar S. M. Jiba, the Deputy Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Fisheries and Water Resources, Mumadu Mbai Jabo, Minister of Environment and Natural Resources, Permanent Secretary, Ms. Ms. Musukeba Sonko, Executive Director, Minister of Lands and Regional uh, Administration, uh, Mr. Yaya Barrow, Managing Director, the Gambia National Petroleum Corporation, uh, Mr. Yero Jallo, Deputy Managing Director, Gambia National Petroleum Corporation, uh, Ms. Kani Job Tao, Director of Exploration and Production, uh, Gambia National Petroleum Corporation, uh, Madam Aja Mariama Ba, Senior Legal uh, Officer, Gambia National Petroleum Corporation, Mr. Lamin Mani, Geoscience Manager, Gambia National Petroleum Corporation, uh, Mr. Malik Ba, from Director of Technical Service, National Environmental Agency, Mr. Lamin B, J. Samati, uh, National Environmental Agency, Mr. Nyalau Baro, Commissioner, Department of Labor, Mr. Siddharth B. Sani, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Labor, Mr. Aliu Jao, Assistant Director, Geological Department, Mr. Mansour Job, Director of Legal and Investigation, National Human Rights Commission, Mr. Sarah Konate, yeah, Ms. Sarah, Sarah Konate, Director, the Program and Operation, Gambia Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Mr. Bubakar Saho, Project Manager, Gambia Chamber of Commerce and Industry. The Joint Committee relied on the testimonies of witnesses to review the details of the petroleum bill, clause by clause, taking due notice of any input aimed at adding value to the content of the bill. Cross-references were made to ensure that the content of the bill was brought into conformity with the Constitution of the Republic 1997, the Public Enterprise Act 1993, and the Public Finance Act 2014. The summary of the evidence, Honorable Speaker. The Petroleum Commission Bill has five parts, 27 clauses, and one schedule. The objective of the bill is to provide a regulatory framework for the management and development of petroleum activities in the upstream and midstream sectors of the industry in order to ensure optimum expo exploration, development, production, and utilization of petroleum resources 
to optimally facilitate the socio-economic development of the Gambia and the enhancement of the general welfare of the people. The evidence gathered indicated the vacuum left in the interpretation of what constitute the upstream and midstream sectors of the petroleum exploration, development, production, and utilization process and related matters, which are the main concerns of the bill. The Joint Committee got sufficient evidence to enrich content of Clause 1. The factors which necessitated the proposed establishment of a Petroleum Commission have been fully explored and revealed as incorporated in Clause 2. The monitoring and regulatory role of the Commission, as well as the policy implications and desired outcome are clearly embedded in Clause 2 and 3, which define the strategic objectives and functions of the Commission. The evidence gathered had added value in improving content. The witnesses pondered on the management architecture and emphasized the necessity for the board and management to manifest competence and professionalism in all their undertakings in the service of the Commission. The witnesses expressed concerns on how to prevent political interference and evidence was adduced on the probable ways of shielding the Commission. Members from undue political interference in the performance of their duties as reflected in the content of proposed amendments covering Clause 6 to Clause 16. A key issue that was buttressed by witnesses is the inclusion of local content in the bill in terms of interpretation and operational focus in order to ensure optimum participation of Gambians and Gambian companies in sustainable petroleum activities for sustainable socio-economic development that will enable the country and the people to derive maximum benefits from the upstream and midstream sectors. In that regard, witnesses considered the indispensability of building a viable and adequately resourced national petroleum company through financial endowments and requisite training to promote and safeguard national interests in the upstream and midstream sectors, as well as provide a support base for the participation of private Gambian companies. In the same vein, the witnesses concur that the Commission should not be deprived of public financial support if necessary, but should have its resource base anchored on credible self-financing sources of income and schemes resting on pillars of transparency and accountability in financial management. Clause 17 to 21 and the proposed amendments aim to provide the desired financial architecture. Finally, the witnesses envisage that the Commission would be a monitoring and regulatory body overseeing the proper development of the upstream and midstream sectors that must make binding decisions which may be subjected to appeal but should be free from any political interference. The laws governing its decisions, the regulations guiding compliance with the rules of engagement in the sector, and the schedule mapping out the method of public disclosure of operational activities are proposed in Clause 22 to 27 and the first schedule of the bill. Scrutiny, consideration, findings, opinion, and recommendation. Opinion of the committee on clause one. Clause one on the part one preliminary, short title, evidence. The committee observes that the intention is to have the bill enacted in 2020. This is why the short title of the bill reads, this act may be cited as the Petroleum Commission Act 2020. Consideration. Since the bill is to be enacted in 2021, if passed in 2021, it is considered necessary to amend clause one of the bill, the short title, by removing the year 2020 in the bill and insert the year 2021. Advice. It is proposed that Clause 1, as amended and incorporated in Annex 1, stands as part of the bill. 
Opinion of the Committee on Clause 2, Interpretation, Evidence. The Joint Committee received evidence that the key operational concepts or terminologies concerning activities in the petroleum sector are either absent or inadequately captured in the clause on interpretation. Consideration. The Joint Committee marked the absence of the following key concepts connected to petroleum activities under interpretation clause in the bill. A licensee, midstream, petroleum act, upstream. The mover of the bill concords and undertook to include the interpretation of the above mentioned terms in the bill incorporating the proposed amendments as recommended for adoption by the Senate. Furthermore, the Joint Committee observed that the following terms are not adequately defined in the bill. Financial year, government, local content, petroleum activities, petroleum data, petroleum resources, petroleum reserves, reconnaissance exploration. The mover of the bill concerned, concurred, and undertook to provide the definitions as proposed in the version of the bill incorporating proposed amendments. Advice. It is proposed that clause two with amendment as presented in the version of the bill incorporating all the amendments stands as part of the bill. Opinion of the committee on clause three. Clause three, establishment of the Petroleum Commission. Evidence. The evidence adduced confirmed the importance of establishing such a commission before the activities on petroleum exploration, development, and production evolve and flourish to an unmanageable scale without enacting a law on petroleum governance as has happened in other jurisdictions to their detriment. Consideration. The Joint Committee considered the consensual opinion as valid and did not register any proposal for amendment that could be considered to be in line with current or better practice. It is therefore proposed that clause three without amendment stands as part of the bill. Clause four, objectives of the commission. Evidence. Witnesses observed that it was not the role of the commission to implement policies in general for the sustainable development of the petroleum sector but to monitor and regulate the sector and ensure compliance with the acts, regulations, licenses, permits, and related policies. Consideration. The committee considered the objectives and observed that the commission should focus on its key functions of monitoring and regulating petroleum activities in the upstream and midstream sectors aim at enhancing sustainable socioeconomic development of the country and safeguarding local content by ensuring compliance with the Act, regulations, licenses, permits, and related policies. Advice, it is proposed that Clause 4 with amendments stands as part of the bill as incorporated in Annex 1. Clause 5, functions of the Commission. Evidence, in safeguarding local content, the witnesses express the desire for a more equitable sharing of responsibility to market petroleum data, as well as to secure benefit from the earnings to promote the sustainability of local content initiatives. It was given in evidence that all the countries have enactments promoting local content, including supporting national enterprises and nationals to participate in their petroleum midstream and upstream industry. It was observed that a national oil company that represents government's participating interests in licenses has a shared responsibility to promote and market petroleum data, which is the basis for investment by license holders who serve as partners. Consideration, members gave consideration to all the concerns, but the evidence did not factor any proposed amendments. It is proposed that clause five without amendments 
stand as part of the bill as reflected in Annex 1. Clause 6, establishment of the board of the commission. Evidence. It is evident that, contrary to Section 175 of the Constitution, the bill seeks to grant the President the power to appoint the members of the board in consultation with the Minister and the Public Service Commission. The Constitution limits the consultation exercise to the PSC. The witnesses gave the reasons why the composition should include a social and environmental specialist. Witnesses who express the aim to protect fish stocks against threats in developing the upstream and midstream sectors proposed for the geoscientists to be replaced by a marine biologist. Evidence was led as to who the one other person should be in the list of members. The GCCI had a strong position that, as a representative body of the private sector in the Gambia since 1967, it should be represented in the board. According to the evidence given by GCCI, it is the champion for local content advocacy and does engage government on a daily basis to express opinions that inform policy, legislation, and regulation. They deem it fit to have the GCI represented as a member of the board of the Petroleum Commission. It was further observed that since the composition of the board allows the membership of a private person, it is recommended that employees of private or international license holders and contracting companies, stakeholders, shareholders of private international entities operating in or providing services to the petroleum sector be disqualified from holding board appointments to avoid conflicts of interest. Consideration. The committee considered clause six. Eventually, consensus was built to retain the services of a geoscientist while adding the service of a social and environmental specialist. The consideration to appoint board members is also to be in line with the Constitution. The President may take note of the proposal of the GCCI and the other cautionary remarks when appointing the one other person, especially the need to balance the gender divide in the composition of the board. Advice. It is proposed that Clause 6 with amendments stands as part of the bill as incorporated in Annex 1. Functions of the board. Clause 7. Evidence. The witnesses indicated that the Commission is a regulatory authority and not a policy-making authority. And wherever the function of policy-making is expressed or implied, it should be qualified. Consideration. The committee made observations that the policy-making power of the Commission should be limited by law to the internal operational directives of the Commission rather than the general policies of the sector, which is the responsibility of the Minister. Advice. It is proposed that Clause 7 with amendments stands as part of the bill as incorporated in Annex 1. Clause 8. Tenure of Office of Members. Evidence. The witnesses did raise concern regarding the turnover of non-ex-official and ex-official members. The proposal is in, is in evidence that the non-ex-official members be required to serve a term of three years, uh, renewable only once. An additional provision was proposed for the post of secretary to the board to arrange the meeting of the board, keep a record of the proceedings of the board, and perform such other duties as the board or the director general may direct. Consideration. The committee considered the content of the clause and the substance of the recommendation, but had no input. Honorable Speaker, then we move to clause number nine. After the advice is given that it is proposed that clause eight without amendments stand as part of the bill as incorporated in Annex 1. Clause 9 constitutes the vacation of office. Evidence, the clause charges the Director General to inform the President of a vacancy 
in the composition of the board to the minister and the president to find a replacement without, within reasonable time. Within reasonable time. Consideration. The committee observed that it is the director general and not the minister who informs the president of any vacancy in the board and such notification and any subsequent appointment are not time bound. The mover and team concord with the proposed amendments which seek to give seven days to the Director General to inform the Minister of any vacancy, 14 days to the Minister to convey the information to the President, and 45 days to the President to fill the vacancy. Advice, it is proposed that Clause 9 with amendments stands as part of the bill as incorporated in Annex 1. Clause 10, meetings of the board. Evidence. It was revealed that the Public Enterprise Act provides for a quorum of five members instead of a simple majority as stated in the bill. Consideration. The committee observed the need for the bill to be brought into conformity with the Constitution and the Public Enterprise Act. The mover concord. Advice. It is proposed that clause 10 with amendments stand as part of the bill as incorporated in Annex 1. Clause 11, disclosure of interest. Evidence. The witnesses did not raise any adverse concerns. Consideration. The committee considered the clause dealing with disclosure of interest before participation in board deliberations and the implication of not doing so. It is proposed that the person making any disclosure of interest should not remain seated during the deliberations of the board in respect to the matter. Advice, it is proposed that clause 11 with amendments stands as part of the bill as incorporated in Annex 1. Clause 12, establishment of committees. Evidence, the witnesses did not but stress the importance of local, I'm sorry, the witnesses did but stress the importance of local content and the need for a participatory approach in promoting it. Consideration. The committee considered the clause and concord with the concerns of the witnesses. Advice. It is proposed that clause 12, without amendment, stands as part of the bill as incorporated in Annex 1. Clause 13. Remuneration and expenses of members of the board. The witnesses raised no concerns. Consideration, the committee considered the content but had no input. Advice, it is proposed that Clause 13, without amendment, stand as part of the bill as incorporated on the Annex 1. Part 3, the Director General and Staff of the Commission. Clause 14, appointment of the Director General. Evidence, evidence was led whether the management of the Commission should be led by a Commissioner or Director General and whether the Director General is to be designated as head of the Commission. The witnesses conceived the Director General as the Chief Executive Officer of the Commission. It was observed that Clause 14.2b does indicate that the Director General should hold qualifications and be experienced in matters relevant to the principal functions of the Commission, but did not qualify the standards expected by, to be met. Consideration, the committee observed that the clause including the commission indicating the clause indicating that the commission is headed by a director general could be misleading. It proposed terms that defines role. It also noted the qualification and experience required for appointment of director general must be stipulated. The proposed amendment calls for no less than five years working experience in matters dealing with the functions of the commission and an advanced degree in the sector. Advice, it is proposed that Clause 14 with amendment as incorporated in Annex 1 stands as part of the bill. Functions of the Director General. Evidence, the witness did raise concerns of competence and professionalism. Consideration, it was observed that the function could be enlarged to merit consideration in appointment. The importance of adding the responsibility of exercising direction in the implementation of the Act and regulations and facilitating appropriate guidelines and regulations for the optimization, for the operationalization 
of the permits and licenses was highlighted. Advice, it is proposed that Clause 15, with amendment, as incorporated in Annex 1, stands as part of the bill. Clause 16, staff of the Commission. Evidence, the witness did not raise any concern. Consideration, the committee did observe that the board should undertake to provide guidelines for the appointment of staff of the Commission in line with the standard set with the guidance of the Public Service Commission as required by the Constitution. It is advised, it is proposed that Clause 16 without amendments as incorporated in Annex 1 stands as part of the bill. Financial provisions, part four, clause 17, forms of the commission. Evidence, it was revealed that a trend is developing as a matter of state policy for public enterprises to generate their own revenue from their own sources of funding instead of relying on monies appropriated by an act of the National Assembly. It was observed that monies paid to the local content fund could be a major source of funding for the Petroleum Commission. Consideration. The committee saw the need to amend Clause 17 to make the provision designed to derive funds from the consolidated fund discretionary instead of being mandatory as originally put in the bill. The management of the fund for training by the ministry was also questioned, and the mover and team agreed to transfer its management to the commission while the minister provides regulations to ensure accountability. Advice. It is proposed that clause 17 with amendments as incorporated in Annex 1 stands as part of the bill. Clause 18. Expenses of the commission. Evidence. The witnesses had no comments to advance Consideration, the committee had no input in the consideration of the clause. Advice, it is proposed that clause 18, without amendment, as incorporated in Annex 1, stands as part of the bill. Annual estimates, clause 19. Evidence, the witnesses did not make any observation on this clause. Consideration, the committee had no additional input. Advice, it is proposed that clause 19, without amendment, as incorporated in Annex 1, stand as part of the bill. Clause 20, accounts of an audit. Evidence. It was evident that it was not tenable for statement of accounts to be submitted to the Auditor General three months before the end of a financial year, as stated in the bill, as indicated in Clause 20. Consideration. The committee observed the need for amendment of the clause to bring it into conformity with the Public Enterprise Act so that statement of accounts would be submitted three months after the end of each financial year. Advice, it is proposed that clause 20 with amendments as incorporated in Annex 1 stands as part of the bill. Clause 21, annual report. Evidence, the bill seeks to mandate the commission to submit annual reports to the National Assembly without any stipulation of a time frame which is at variance with Section 175 of the Constitution. Consideration, the committee observed the divergence of Clause 21 with the provisions of Section 175 of the Constitution and sought for compliance with the Constitution and the Public Enterprise Act in framing the clauses. The mover and team concurred with the view and undertook to put the necessary amendments in place to ensure that the activity report and financial statement of the Commission are submitted to the National Assembly within three months of the end of its financial year. Advice, it is proposed that Clause 2, with amendments, as incorporated in Annex 1, stands as part of the bill. Miscellaneous, Part 5, protection of members and staff of the Commission. That was also subjected to a review. And the members considered the evidence. The witnesses did indicate the clause, that the clause which aimed to protect commission members and staff from suits and prosecution seemed to insulate members of the board from individual responsibility and dilutes accountability. 
consideration, it was observed that giving immunity to members and staff of the Commission in the exercise of uh, their lawful duty is susceptible to scrutiny by the courts when the lawfulness of any action is in question. The clause may need further scrutiny to provide protection without the possibility of abuse. Advice, it is proposed that Clause 22, without amendment, stand as part of the bill as incorporated in Annex 1. Clause 22, 23, compliance with decisions of the Commission. Evidence, the witnesses raised no objections, consideration. It is observed that the licenses and subcontractors have the duty to abide by the lawful decisions of the Commission, since they have the right to appeal if they are aggrieved by any questionable decision in terms of lawfulness. Advice, it is proposed that Clause 23, without amendment, as presented in Annex 1, stands as part of the bill. Clause 24, review of decision. Evidence, it is observed that powers of the minister to review complaints from persons aggrieved by a decision of the commission and even set aside the decision of the commission could lead to undue political interference. It was proposed that a complaints panel be established to deal with complaints. Consideration, the setting up of a special committee of independent eminent persons to review complaints of a person aggrieved by a decision of the commission was proposed to be a better option. The mover of the motion concord. Advise it is proposed that clause 24 with amendment as incorporated in NS1 stands part of the bill. Clause 25, relationship with other entities. Evidence, the witnesses raise no concern. Consideration, the provision is considered to reflect the desirability and inevitability of building genuine relationships in the performance of the functions of the commission. Advise it is proposed that clause 26 stands part of the bill without amendment as provide, provided for in Annex 1. Regulations, clause 26, evidence. The witnesses had no objection to the power of the minister to make regulations. Consideration, the committee is of the opinion that all regulations are classified as subsidiary legislation which are subjected to a review by the relevant committee of the National Assembly Understanding Order uh, 80. Advice in that regard, it is proposed that clause 26 stands as part of the bill without amendment as provided for in Annex 1. Clause 27, inconsistency with all the laws. Evidence, it was received in evidence that the provision as framed could lead to many interpretations and the automatic ousting of all laws relating to licenses in licensing in the upstream and midstream sectors without proper impact assessment of the implications to relevant sectors. Other institutions felt that this provision will be used to usurp their power. They want to replace the phrase licensing in the upstream and midstream with the phrase regulation of the upstream and midstream sectors. Consideration, it was observed and the move of the bill concord that the bill is not centered on licensing in particular, but on regulation of the upstream and midstream sectors. Hence, clause 27 was reviewed accordingly. Advice, it is proposed that clause 27 with amendments as incorporated in Annex 1 stands as part of the bill. Honorable Speaker, that is the exercise that this committee had uh, undertaken to be able to guide this National Assembly as it moves to the next phase after the committee stage, and that is the consideration stage. And uh, the co-chairs will be leading the National Assembly uh, regarding the amendments uh, that uh, are recommended, so that as we read clause by clause at the consideration stage, uh, the co-chairs will be intervening to make proposals of the amendments uh, and we accept that uh, work has been done uh, and concurrence had been achieved with the minister and in that regard uh, we should not have much difficulty 
at the consideration stage. That is the objective of the committee stage, to help the National Assembly to prepare itself for the consideration stage. And in that regard, uh, Honorable Speaker, I take my seat. Thank you very much, um, the mover. Any second? Jimara. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, I rise to second the uh, motion, and uh, I will take this opportunity to thank the select committee for the good work they did um, for this report. Thank you very much. I now put the question, it has been moved and seconded that this Honorable Assembly do consider the report of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts Committee, Environment and Sustainable Development and NGO uh, Affairs. Public Enterprise. Public Enterprise. Uh, public Enterprise Committee, Environment and Sustainable Development and NGO Affairs on the Petroleum Commission Bill 2020. Those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those not in favor, please say no. The ayes have it. Any honorable member who wishes to take part in the debate may do so by raising your constituency tag. Councillor, honorable member for councillor to start with. Raise your tax. Thank you very much, um, Honorable Speaker. I may not dwell too long on the subject matter before us, because when the co-chair of the Joint Committee uh, was making the presentation, I was with him. And uh, I believe um, revisiting our standing orders, which was done by the committee whose mandate it was, was actually a step in the right direction. Looking at the approach in terms of reviewing what comes before us by committing it to the relevant committees have actually added value in the work we do in this National Assembly. Honorable Speaker, we will not dispute that since we started committing various reports, since we started committing bills to the relevant committees, the committees in question have done a thorough job by inviting the relevant stakeholders. So one would conclude that when a report from the committee is laid before us, it represents the view of the entire population. Because these stakeholders, each of them represent a segment of the society. So it has been widely consultative. And uh, honestly, Honorable Speaker, like I said earlier on, I may, I may not delabor because we will go to the next level where the two committees, through the leadership of the co-chairpersons, will be guiding this, the business of the day accordingly. On that note, I want to say thank you very much to the work of the Joint Committee. This was expected, but again, it's not a surprise because that was the reason why the plenary had the confidence to commit this bill in your hands. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member for Councillor. Honorable Member for Bacau, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. I haven't got that much to say, but then I have an observation of which I would like a clarification from the presenter of the report. In the report, I haven't seen where the nomination or, or the membership of the commission should be done. So I would like the mover of the report to clarify that issue. And there is an indication in the report that uh, there should be an immunity for commission members. But then I would still want an explanation of how of that immunity should be done for commission members. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Member for Jara East, the floor is yours. 
and Mr. Speaker, thank you very much for giving me the floor. Uh, I don't have much to say, just to thank our able presenter on our behalf for a job well done. You'll agree with me that, Mr. Speaker, this report was totally, you know, investigated and it was totally dissected by the Joint Committee. Uh, Mr. Speaker, at this juncture, allow me to register our profound gratitude to our able stakeholders who also participated in making this report what it is today. Honorable Speaker, the Minister of Petroleum and Energy have contributed immensely uh, in making this report what it is today. We must thank them for their professionalism and the level of maturity they have displayed during you know, our discussions. Honorable Speaker, I also want to thank all the members of the Joint Committees for the wonderful work they have done, the time, the interest they have you know, injected in making so this report is stable today. Honorable Speaker, I also want to thank the Office of the Clerk to the Speaker and our various you know, committees, that is the Committee of PEC, Standing Committee of PEC, and the Select Committee of Environment, plus our indefatigable committee clerk in the party of Fatma Keta for a job well done. Honorable Speaker, with these few remarks, I will take my seats and await the positive interventions or critiques or queries of honorable members. Thank you very much. Thank you, honorable member for Jara. Is honorable member for Central Badibu. The floor is yours. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Uh, Honorable Speaker, the report before us uh, is a very good report and is timely. And I believe the committees that were mandated to look into the bill did a tremendous work and the stakeholders for appearing as witnesses. Honorable Speaker, by looking at the objective, or the object of the bill, uh, it's clearly stipulated. The object of the bill is to provide a regulatory framework for the management and development of petroleum activities in the upstream and midstream sectors of the industry in order to ensure optimum exploration, development, production, and utilization of petroleum resources to optimally facilitate the socio-economic development of the Gambia and the enhancement of the general welfare of the Gambian people. Mm -hmm. Honorable Speaker, the object is self-explanatory. And there are a lot of things that are happening in the industry, the petroleum industry. So having a law to serve as a guide so that the resources benefit the poor people, I think that's that's, that's the right step in the right direction. Honorable Speaker, um, but if you look at the bill uh, on page 10, it said the key issues that was portrayed by witnesses in the inclusion of local content in the bill in terms of interpretation and operational focus in order to ensure optimum participation of Gambians and Gambian companies in sustainable petroleum activities for sustainable socio-economic development that would enable the country and the people to drive maximum benefits mm -hmm. from the upstream and midstream uh, sectors. Um, Honorable Speaker, I want the mover of the motion or the person who laid the report to help this August garden because we don't see how our local companies or our local people or the partners are involved. How are they protected in the bill? Because you know, uh, um, we need to see it in the bill, not only to be reported, but we have to see it in the bill where they are safeguarded, where they can also uh, 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 participate in the economic activity or in the competition. Um, if it is there, let him help me. I haven't seen it anywhere. So the other one is uh, in the report, uh, page 15. Evidence was laid as to who the one, who the one other person should be in the list of members. The GCCI had a strong position that 
as the representative body of the private sector in the Gambia since 1967, it should be represented in the board. According to the evidence given, the GCCI is the champion for local content advocacy and those engage government on a daily basis to express opinions that inform policy, legislation, and regulation. They deem it fit to have the GCC represented as a member of the board of the Petroleum Commission. I believe the committee should have, you know, accepted, you know, what, 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 what has been you know, uh, advanced by GCCI. GCCI should be part of the board because if you look at their mandate, what they do, as far as petroleum is concerned, you know, they can also have a voice. So, but, you know, if you look at the uh, consideration made by the committee, you know, that they leave it like that for the, uh, for the president, you know, can, can nominate somebody to be part of it in, in, in terms of gender. Uh, for me, I'm not comfortable with that. I believe this house, we can also, we can all recommend that let GCC, GCCI be represented in the board. So I don't know whether, you know, in the, uh, in the other laws, it, do, it will not work well, but if there is no, you know, uh, problem as far as the law, laws, laws are concerned, I think GCCI should be part of the uh, board. So these are some of the observations that I have, and uh, I thank everybody for participating in making this bill a bill, a draft. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member for Central Baribu. Honorable Member for Fonny Prefect, the floor is yours. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Mine is a small proposal. Uh, if I refer the, the Honorable House to page 16, uh, clause, particular clause 9, vacation, vacation of office. I, I, I would uh, propose, if that's not the, uh, the, the, the normal procedure, uh, where it is the, the means, the composition of the board, uh, the replacement of, of, uh, of membership of the board by the minister and the president to find a replacement within a reasonable uh, time. The proposal is uh, whether the committee, the Kaye committee would like to uh, propose a timeline. If uh, what is reasonable, what, uh, what is deemed as, as, as reasonable uh, to, to uh, one party could not be reasonable to another party. But if this is not the normal uh, trend, I propose for a uh, uh, of, of, of a timeline. That's my, that's my recommendation. But uh, just to thank the Q&A committee for a job well done. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Member for Lower Newby. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, I doubt whether my intervention would have anybody who would be a witness that in the establishments of boards, board members, and so forth, indigenous local people have been involved, have been selected. It looks as if the establishment of all boards is centered on the fact that you have to be that to be literate, to be able to qualify you as a member of the board. Why not we go further? Because we are talking of local content. And these resources do not belong to those people. It belongs to the nation. Nation which is composed of people who have that tubab knowledge and the ones that do not have that knowledge. And they still claim to be part and parcel of this nation. Why don't we start considering them, even if they are not that literate? Some of them could be literate in Arabic. Some of them with sensitization would come to conform. May I put that suggestion so, so that the petroleum commission, the petroleum committee, or the select committee, whatever form it may be taking, would start considering putting in local people, even if they are going to be taken from Wuli, or from Nyamanar, or wherever. Let them be members of the board. Thank you very much. Honorable Speaker. Thank you. Um, Papa Fladu West. 
Yes, I um, just want to add my voice to my colleagues for thanking the uh, uh, two committees you know, that have spent you know, um, quite an extensive time and uh, effort to uh, uh, go into this uh, bill uh, deeper than I thought they would have done. They have, they, they have done. Um, we are dealing with an issue here which can be either a blessing you know, or a cause to this country and its future. Petroleum and petroleum no products have shattered countries, have uh, affected their you know, social, economic, and political fabrics to extents you know, on rip now, beyond repair. And, uh, from the onset, I, I, I did you know, uh, uh, echo and uh, 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 express my appreciation for the establishment, or for this bill, you know, trying to establish a commission that is going to uh, help oversight bodies do a function that needs expertise. Uh, knowledge and experience to, to understand. Uh, as, as an institution, the, the National Assembly would not be able to conduct certain oversight on uh, such issues. And um, having a commission specifically looking into regulating this industry is something Gambia needs to do long before uh, this product you know, is even uh, come to surface. So I definitely uh, implore the government, uh, the minister, for uh, a job well done, for the committee, for this insightful, uh, extensive exercise on scrutinizing every single provision of the bill. And uh, to be honest, you know, we can all look at this, uh, this uh, report and say for sure, definitely, you know, there's not one page that is left unattended. And therefore, you know, I just want to uh, again, just come and add my voice to my colleagues. So thank you know, everybody who has participated you know, so far. And uh, looking forward to the committee level so that we can also have uh, our little inputs in, 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 in finalizing this uh, enactment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Member for Upper Flood West. Honorable Member for Busumbala, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. I will be very brief, I believe so. I only have a... First of all, let me thank the committee for a very good job that they've done, because we've, we've seen the work that they do, where they have problems, discussions, and concessions. It's very clear that they have done a very good job, and the, the, the report is bulky, but it's, it's readable and easy to understand. My concern as people's representative, given a reference to uh, my constituency, you have some boreholes that are deep. I'm just giving a, an example. You know, boreholes are deep in communities, but those communities are not supplied with water. So um, I want to be enlighten more on the aspect of local content than I related to royalties to the communities. communities. This, because these factories, this oil, are going to be extracted, extracted from communities, from lands that are belongs to communities. So what will be the, the benefit of such community, communities in case production and exploitation of this mineral, mineral resources started? That's why I give this, this example. And I, I think it might not be correct, but in, in Nigeria they will say where oil is coming, the region that oil is coming from is the, mo, the most underdeveloped. So I, I just, just maybe, maybe factual or maybe not factual, but I'm just, that's why I'm trying to give you the issue of boreholes in my constituency. And those communities are not uh, supplied with water, but the waters are drawn to other communities. So I want to ask this question to be enlightened more. What will be the benefit of, of a community that is endowed with these mineral resources to be exploited for the betterment of the country? What will be the, the benefit of that com community, um, which I believe so, Mandiri is part of it. So that's my question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Member for Busumbala. He is the last on my list. Any other Honorable Member who wants to come in before I call the mover? No, Honorable Members are finished.
Since uh, there is no honorable member who wanted to come in, I will now call the Honorable Minister of Petroleum to clear, answer some of the questions in the wine. Thank you very much, um, Honorable Speaker. I try to get some um, notes on the questions. I hope I get all the questions right, or else I need some help. Um, the first question on, from Bakao, I don't actually understand. The nomination of the, the committee, I don't fully get the question. But the nomination to the board, so I don't, I don't fully understand the question. And also the instrument of immunity, I think that's a legal uh, matter. Um, virtually all laws of this nature have uh, the kind of immunity. You know, so that is what I, what I don't fully understand the question. But when you come to other questions from Central Body and uh, all the others for me, basically, uh, not for me actually, Central Body you can concern matters of um, local content. You see, local content itself is a whole matter uh, that requires more policy and regulations. I mean, uh, this particular law is establishing a commission that will coordinate everything, including local content. So the, pro, uh, the plan actually is, which you've discussed at the level of the committee, local content will come up itself as a whole act of itself and a policy that will expand the benefit to the people and who participate in, 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 the, in, the, in the industry. And uh, we have even started sensitizing private sector in the participation with the Invest Africa, the scope and capacity of private sector involved in the petroleum activities. So when you come to issues of um, local people being part of the board, that will come at other level. Local, local people participation comes at different levels, depending on where they participate. For example, in, in, in a program of seismic activities, service, you know, the, the seismic ship will buy food commodities, vegetables. Their local content is to get the su supplier from the country, from those people who are selling goods, from the, to, to be able to participate in providing that kind of services. So it is from the, the regulatory body to su providing services and actual petroleum um, 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 drilling or exploration, development, and production. So this bill is actually establishing the funds commission that will coordinate all that. So that, that is the whole essence. So local content itself. It definitely is, 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 is very academic at the moment, you know, and uh, um, all countries are now going towards developing. This is also in line with ECOWAS, um, 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 ECOWAS protocol, and ECOWAS is also, also helping the uh, countries to develop local content. Local content is very key in all extractive industries. So, and also there is a concern about resource cause or Dutch disease. This is, is also a debate. Resource cause, of course, you see uh, petroleum, and uh, the extractive industry have, having effects on the people, the lives, and also even security. That is true. But that's not only, only petroleum. Any country that is resourceful, depending on how you manage it, it can be a source cause. But we have also seen countries where this resource has been put to maximum use. For example, UAE, you know, and other countries are also developing. Ghana is doing very well now in, on, the, on, on the petroleum uh, resources. So we, we also try to learn from all these areas. Give, people go give examples of other countries where actually it has been a problem. No disease whereby it affects the economy, the production sector is neglected because of oil flowing and money flowing. That has happened in many countries too. So we also have to learn. But that is actually what we together need to decide. Because it all depends on the economics and the, the policy of the country. So if you get the resources, you know how to use it, utilize it, and what to spend, use the money, you can uh, address those kind of issues. But definitely, resources are there. If they are there, they are for the people. Then it depends on the people to be able to make use of the resources. So these are concerns that we have, and this is why we are putting in instruments. One, get our, our, our institutions ready, get our laws ready, 
we, 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 we as, as we just told the committee, we are also coming up with the revenue management policy and act. So all these instruments will help towards those, those the, um, uh, fears of local of, of um, Dutch disease or, or resource costs. And, uh, and uh, there's a question also on the um, committee on GCCI. I think we have debated it at extent, extent with the committee. You see, G we, GCCI has more role, even more than this one. You know, because if you look at the, there's, there's the commission, petroleum commission, there is also the, the petroleum uh, GNPC Act. So GCCI has a role in all this, all this. In virtually in everything, but, but why we have a provision for private sector activity, and that private sector can be a member of GCCI. That's why the private sector, GCCI is in the private sector, and there is a private sector, a private people a participation in the board. Those they can be members of GCCI, but not actual institution is the private people. So even though we give, put up a, um, of, of, uh, a strong case, but we've considered it at a committee level. I think the committee, some of the committee members will actually um, keep into this. And I think that there was a kind of vacation timeline. I think the timeline, I do not get the question also, well, but um, I think everything has been discussed at, at, at the committee level, and uh, I think that is um, so far what I have. But the emphasis of local content is what I want to emphasize here. Definitely, local content is not only the concern of this assembly, it's the concern of, 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 of government, the ministry, and also the concern of ECOWAS at the African Union level. Local content is now a concern everywhere, and then we are to, to, to go along the equal standards. Definitely, the local content has to come, but it has to be on, on policy. That's what I believe. Not only a clause in, 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 in the petroleum law, in the, or the, there's a clause also local content, local participation, and the, 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 in, the, in the licenses, but that's not enough. I think we should go beyond that to have a more um, 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 policy of law on local content. It's too important to be just on a cross or here and here and there. I think there should be more police on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Minister, for the clarity. May I now call on the mover, Honorable Court Care Person to respond to the issues raised on the report and while of the debate. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. As the Honorable Minister has said, there is a question from the member for Bacau regarding the composition. Well, the composition of the board is already clear in the bill itself. So, and that is clause six, that it comprises a chairperson, the director general, and we have seen a geoscientist, a legal practitioner, the permanent secretary of the ministry, and one other person including the social, these are recommendations we've made, adding the social and environmental uh, specialists. So essentially, if you accept our recommendation, we'll be adding social to the environmental specialists, uh, and that will be the composition of the board. Uh, that, is, that is the reality. I don't know whether you have any objection on that. Now, the issue of immunity is provided for in the bill in clause 22. And as we will review when we come to the uh, consideration stage, uh, we can advance that now so that it becomes clearer, so that we will not have much problem. What he's saying is that an action, a suit, prosecution, or other proceedings shall not be brought or instituted against a member of the board or staff of the commission personally personally that's the word you cannot sue them personally for why is that the case well it's already clear because 
uh, clause 3 is actually telling you that this there is established an aquifer petroleum commission and uh, there is established by this act the petroleum commission so the commission is established and it's saying that the commission is a body corporate with perpetual succession and common seal and may sue or be sued in its corporate name. So you can sue the commission. You cannot sue somebody personally who is acting on behalf of the commission. I think that is, that is the essence. And that's why the immunity is given. It's not giving immunity to the commission, but that you cannot sue somebody personally because the person is acting in the corporate name of, of the commission. I hope that is clear. Now, uh, in terms of uh, the member for Fony Brefet, well, clause nine is already clear. Uh, what you said is what the actual bill is saying. It's open, it's vague, nothing is there. But if you look at uh, the clause nine after the review, we are actually making uh, a recommendation. So our recommendation uh, is already read for you. And I hope that uh, you will accept our own recommendation, sorry. So our recommendation is saying that uh, the, is saying, it's okay. It's saying that it is proposed, the proposal we are making, your page and my page will not be the same because uh, I have bad eyes, so I have extended to be big. But look at clause nine, clause nine, whatever page you have. Hmm? Clause 9 is saying the consideration, the committee observed that it is the director general and not the minister who informs the president of any vacancy in the board and such notification and any subsequent appointment are not time bound. That's what we have observed. That's what you've observed in the bill. That is the uh, shortcoming of the bill. And we are saying that the mover and team concord. We agree as a team. Uh, with the proposed amendments which seek to give seven days to the director general to inform the minister. So seven days for the director general to inform the minister and the minister of the vacancy and 14 days to the minister to inform the president and 45 days to the president to fill the vacancy. That's, that's, that's the proposed amendment. Yeah. So in that regard, that's precisely we've seen the lacuna and that's the recommendation we are making uh, to fill the gap. Uh, the Honorable Member for Central Badibu uh, did uh, emphasize what the committee observes. Uh, we've, we brought the argument of the GCCI right there so that all of you can, can review. Uh, and whatever finally we, we do uh, is what will be the law. But we left it because of the other observations made, you can see that the two, two observations were made. The GCCI is strongly saying 1967, up till now, we represent local content, but other recommenders saying that we must be careful in terms of who actually becomes a member so that that person will not be representing certain corporate interests. So there are balancing issues there. So are we going to put GCCI there institutionally, which means that the institution selects who represents the institution, and it will matter who will decide, who will guide and say, no, 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 you cannot select this person or that person, or are we going to leave this to be a guiding principles in selecting that one person, and uh, the person selecting will lay emphasis on consultation with GCCI, with all who matter, in order to ensure that that one person represent the interests of the private sector. That is why the committee did not venture too far, because we don't have the information to be able to be concrete about that. And in lawmaking, 
uh, you must be very careful that you don't tie yourself to something that is absurd and that is ambiguous. And that's why the committee did not penetrate. We are, we are not experts on that, so we, we, we leave it. And the minister uh, also uh, recommends what is there. So who are we? We can only challenge that if we have something better, but we, we did not. So in that regard, uh, that is the answer for that one. I believe this were the main concerns. I'm, I cannot remember any other divergent view. So in that regard, Honorable uh, Speaker, I believe that uh, uh, we have put the issue as clearly as we could, and we propose that uh, uh, the members adopt this report uh, as proposed by the committee. Thank you very much. And I also wish to uh, emphasize the cooperation between the co-chairs and the two committees, the diligence showed uh, in our work method, and the development of our clerical staff in uh, building up uh, the basis for writing reports. I believe that if we continue this team approach, uh, we will achieve uh, quite a lot uh, during our, our tenure. And we hope that uh, those I'm not sure, Co-Chair, whether our, our, our partners, the stakeholders, are invited. They, they had, the, especially GCCI, they emphasized that when we hold such meetings, they should be invited. I only hope that we had not also uh, forgotten uh, to do what uh, they proposed. But if we have strong apology to them, they have really spent time uh, to, to be with us, to, to speak with their hearts and minds, and uh, we will continue to hold them dear in the work that we do. And if we fail this time, we will not fail next time in ensuring that they are here to listen to the very evidence they gave us that enabled us to come up with this report. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Honorable Speaker, observation. I didn't get you clear. Yes, I want to make an observation. You want to make? An observation. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Member for Sierra Kunda. Honorable Speaker, uh, yes, I did agree with the Member of Sierra Kunda that in lawmaking you don't tie up yourself. You, you open up in case of anything. But I just want to remind the House if you could remember the Women Enterprise Fund, when we are looking at the bill, the institutions that you know are so much linked to the uh, to the to the women uh, to the fund, or they have a hand in dealing with women, particularly the Women's Federation. We did give consideration to those uh, uh, federations to be part of uh, board. They become board members. Now, for GCCI, you know, this this is an institution that has a lot to deal with commerce when it comes to um, uh, the economy. And I believe having them as board members, having a representative in the board will also help a lot. So I am still appealing to the whole house to really look at this, you know, having them as a member of the board. Because if not, if they are not represented, we leave it like that somebody else might be choosing somewhere which, which might not really represent the commerce uh, area. That's, that's my that's my stand still. Thank you, co uh, Well, anyway, uh, it's good that we are open about it. But, uh, Honorable Speaker, the next stage is the consideration stage. And each member will have the right, when we get to the clause, uh, to make a proposal. Uh, there is uh, three days before, between the committee stage and consideration stage. If any member wish to send uh, anything to, to, for review or present what the person wants for review of a particular clause, I'm sure the members will consider it and will vote on it. We are just stating the position of the committee, but that is not final. Ultimately, it's the position of the assembly that matters because when we vote, what we vote for is what is going to be there and the member will have at that material time 
uh, the opportunity to, to argue his case. Not now, anyway. But it's good that we are interacting to prepare ourselves for that. Thank you very much, um, co-chair. Um, let me seize this opportunity to thank everyone for their participation. I now put the question on the report. Be it resolved that this Honorable Assembly do adopt the report of the Joint Committee on PEC and Environment, Sustainable Development and NGO Affairs on the Petroleum Commission Bill 2020. Those in favor, please say aye. Those in favor, please say aye. Those not in favor, please say no. The eyes have it. I thank you all. The next stage is consideration stage of the bill. It's now scheduled as per agenda of the session. Thank you, clerk. Let me proceed. <coughs> Report of the Select Committee on Health, Women, Children, Disaster, Refugees and Humanitarian Relief on the Gambian Nationality and Citizenship Amendment Bill 2020 by the Honorable Chairperson of the Committee. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Honor oh. Honorable Member, Honorable Members will recall that the motion for the second reading of the bill entitled to Gambia Nationality and Citizenship Amendment Bill 2020 was moved by the Honorable Minister of Justice. Minister of Justice on Thursday, the 16th July 2020. The motion was seconded and debated on the general merit and the principle of the bill, ensuring accordingly thereafter the bill stood referred to the Assembly Business Committee for committee to ABC Committee. The said bill to be to the Select Committee on Health, Women, Children, Disaster, Refugees, and Humanitarian Relief for scrutiny and report back. The committee is today scheduled to table the report before the Assembly. Once the report is tabled, debated, and adopted, the next stage of the bill, which is the consideration stage, will be scheduled accordingly at the appointed time. I will now, therefore, invite the Honorable Chairperson of the Select Committee on Health, Women, Children, Disaster, Refugee, and Humanitarian Relief to table the report of the committee. Honorable Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, considering that the committee is supposed to be presenting a series of reports before this plenary, this particular report is being, uh, is, is the, the Honorable uh, National Assembly Member for Central Badibu is being tasked to present the report on behalf of the committee. Thank you. Honorable Member for Central Badibu. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, thank you, Honorable Speaker. Um, Honorable Speaker, you have already done the introduction, uh, which I will not waste time on that. I will go to the mandate of the committee. Uh, Standing Order 69 requires the committee not to discuss the principles of the bill, but it details in terms of the clauses. It is thus mandated as follows. List out witnesses, hold proceedings, and take evidence from witnesses. Record the opinion of the committee on each clause and settle of the bill, and apprehend any amendment recommended. Present amendments in order in which they stand in the bill. Present a report incorporating the summary of the evidence of the witnesses, the opinion of the committee on the clauses, and attach relevant records of minutes of its proceedings. Methodology. Since Clause 661B requires a committee at the committee stage of the process 
to engage in detailed investigation when considering a bill committed to it, the select committee called witnesses from the identified institutions and organizations. This was after when each of them was provided with a copy of the bill and those asked to review and present a written report. All position paper on their views and recommendations, if any, for the consideration of the committee. Now, after holding the formal meetings at the National Assembly with the stakeholders from government ministries, departments, and agencies, uh, non-governmental organizations, and civil society organizations, and platforms to present and discuss their written reports, the committee convened a meeting to review and conclude on the positions and validate the report. The Gambia Nationality and Citizenship Amendment Bill 2020, um, the bill, that's what the bill entitled, an act to review and amend the provisions of the Labor Act found to be discriminatory against women and girls in the Gambia, in furtherance of the Gambia's international obligations and in line with the Constitution and for connected matters, enacted by the President and the National Assembly. Now, I will go to the, 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 the sections. Now, section three, repeal of, sorry, three, repeal of section nine, three. Section nine, three is repeal, and which reads as follows. For the purpose of this section, a woman who has been married shall be deemed of full age. Objects and reasons. This amendment is the first of its kind in Africa for being the trail blazer for the recognition, observ observance, and the domestication of international obligations commit and commitments relating to women's rights into domestic laws. Since the enactment of Women's Act 2010, significant strides have been made to enforce the law and to protect women in line with the provisions of the Act. Section 29, 25 of Women's Act recognizes the need for periodic review of legislation every 10 years to ensure further compliance with our international obligations as enshrined in the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, and the Protocol to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights on the Rights of Women in Africa, the Protocol. This amendment is intended to amend and repeal the provisions of this Act that are discriminatory against women as mandated by Section 25 of the Women's Act. Now, the pl planning meeting. The select committee held a meeting on the 29th September 2020 to identify the relevant stakeholders to be consulted and to plan and adopt a roadmap for the engagement. Now, proceedings. Uh, witnesses. The following witnesses or stakeholders from government, non-government organizations, and civil society participated in the consultation on the Gambian Nationality and Citizenship Amendment Bill 2020. Witnesses, Mrs. Rohi Bite Dabo, Ministry of Children and Social Welfare, Sia Kamarong, Ministry of Children and Social Welfare, Fanta Baiseka, Ministry of Health, Lamin Bifati, Ministry of Health, Nafi Sisao Bangura, Ministry of Justice, Abdullah Koli, Ministry of Justice, Mustafa Drame, Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education, Mariam A. M. Sala, Minister of Basic and Secondary Education, Isaac S. Jalo, Minister of Basic and Secondary Education, Jul De Sisi, Ministry of Finance and Economic Affairs, Adama M. Jeng, Galka, Mariam K. Sanyan, Girls Agenda, uh, Roya Namati, Paradise, Paradise Foundation, Fatu Fai Paradise Foundation, Isaac Diu Saune, um, National Women Council, Falu So Network Against Gender Based Violence, Maria Majon Network Against Gender Based Violence, Usman Sisi Network Against Gender Based Violence. Now, the members of the committee in attendance at that meeting, Honorable Usman Silla, the chairperson of the committee, Honorable Fatimata K. Jawara, vice chairperson, Honorable Amadou Kamara, a member, Honorable Amul Nyazi, a member, Honorable Kadi Kamara, a member, De Yasin, Honorable De Yasin Seka, a member, Honorable Umar Dabo, a member, Honorable Siaka Maro, Seku Maro, a member, Sarata Bojang, Secretary, Isatu Sonko, Secretary. Now, oral and written evidence of witnesses. 
office of the president. Now, the position of the vice president, sorry, office of the vice president, the position of the written submission of the office of the vice president is that the repeal act is very discriminatory against women on re renunciation of citizenship by repeal act by reason of due citizenship, dual citizenship or nationality. It indicated that the act defines a minor as a reason or as a person who has not attained the age of 21 years. Adding that this shall construe that a person shall, for the purposes of this act, be of full age if he or, if he or her he or she has attained the age of 21 years and of full capacity if he or she is not of unsound mind. The position further states that there is a contradiction when it comes to renunciation of citizenship as women are deemed of full age as long as they have been married regardless of their age and which it deems unfair. It also argues that this does not take into account girls who are forced into marriage at a young age, who could be forced to renounce their citizenship as they could not take mature decisions. Gambia Immigration Department. Gambia Immigration Department, in its written submission, argues that the bill is necessary simply because, apart from the discriminatory or other adverse effect characterized by Section 9, Subsection 3, against women and girls in the country, it is also inconsistent with Section 2 and 17 of Nationality and Citizenship Act, Act CAP 16.01. Uh, uh, it indicated that if enacted, the bill will further address the apparent inconsistency or conflict centered around the provisions on the interpretation of a minor unrequired age to be eligible to require national identification. It provides the example that if ex female got married as an underage, i.e., below 18 years, and by virtue of nine and C, she is deemed to be of full age and capacity. However, it added that section 17 of the same act makes ex in, ineligible to acquire an ID card until she attains the age of 18. Findings and recommendations of the committee. The Gambia Nationality and Citizenship Amendment Act 2020, so titled, the Act may be cited as the Gambia Nationality and Citizenship Act 2020 observation. The committee observes that the witness are in agreement with clause one on the subtitle of the bill. Committee's recommended, the committee recommends that the clause one on the subtitle stands part of the bill. Two. Amendment of Gambian Nationality and Citizenship Act, 1965, the, the Gambia Nationality, I think that one needs to be corrected. I saw two did it. Now, the Gambia Nationality and Citizenship Act, in this act referred to as the principal act, is amended as set out in this act. Observation and conclusion. The committee observed that the witnesses are in agreement with clause two to stand part of the bill. Committee's recommendation. The committee recommends that the clause two should stand part of the bill. Three, repeal of section three, subsection, section nine, subsection three is repealed. Observation and conclusion. The committee observes that witnesses are in full support of the repeal of section nine, subsection three. Committee's recommendation. The committee recommends for the repeal of section nine, subsection three from the Gambian Nationality and Citizen Act, which reads as follows. For the purpose of this section, a woman who has been married shall be deemed of full age. Observation and conclusion. The committee observes that the witnesses are all in support of the repeal and amendment of section 9, subsection 3, to read as above. The committee's recommendation. The committee recommends for the repeal and amendment of section 9, subsection 3, to read as follows. For the purpose of this section, a woman who has been married shall be deemed of full age. Objects 
and reasons. This amendment is the first of its kind in Africa for being the trailblazer for the recognition, observance, and the domestication of international obligations and commitments relating to women's rights into domestic laws. Since the enactment of the Women's Act 2010, significant strides have been made to enforce the law and to protect women in line with the provisions of the Act. Section 25 of the Women's Act recognizes the need for periodic review of the legislation every 10 years to ensure further compliance with our international obligations as enshrined in the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, and the Protocol to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights on the Rights of Women in Africa. This amendment is intended to amend and repeal the provision, provisions of this Act that are discriminatory against women as mandated by Section 25 of the Women's Act. Observation and conclusion. The Select Committee recommends for the object, objects and reasons to be redrafted in order for it to capture the specific nature of the issue the bill is intended to address as required by Standing Order 64 1A, which states every bill shall be accompanied by a memorandum signed by the person in charge of the bill containing a statement of the objects and reasons of the bill, including the nature of the issue the bill is intended to address. It was agreed by the committee that the tax of the drafting of the and so the, that it is specific to the proposed amendment was as to the team drafts persons councils from the Ministry of Justice. So I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Any second? Sabah Sanjal, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. I rise to second the report, Mosom. And I don't have much to say, maybe to just uh, seek for little clarification, because when I looked at the proposed amendment, nine, section 93, um, uh, for easy reference, I think the, the, the original section should be quoted so that uh, it will be easily referenced. Because uh, some of us did not even have the Parent Act here. So that is what I just see as a, this year on my, on my level. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. I now put the question that has been moved and seconded that this Honorable Assembly do consider the report of the Select Committee on Health, Women, Children, Disaster, Refugee, Humanitarian Relief on the Gambian Nationality and Citizenship Amendment Bill 2020. Those in favor, please say aye. Those in favor, please say aye. Those not in favor, please say no. The ayes have it. Any honorable member who wishes to take part in the debate may do so by raising your constituency tax. Yeah. Honorable member, Honorable member. Honorable member for Banyu, no? The floor is yours. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. I uh, also want to thank the presenter who presented on behalf of the committee for presenting uh, the report on behalf of the committee. Uh, but only to add that uh, for the attention of this plenary that uh, our recommendation regarding the the short title. This report was supposed to be laid last year, 2020. And uh, we recommended that we maintain 2020. But since we are now in 2021, uh, we are proposing that uh, we indicate 2021 as a recommendation of the committee. So for members to take note. Uh, other than that, I think the the presenter did well in presenting this report. Uh, of course, he may be able to respond to honorable uh, for 
Sarawak uh, Sanjal. Well, I think the first part of the report indicates what uh, amendment we are seeking to effect. So I think that has been taken care of. And then, according to the presenter, uh, the committee agreed that uh, since it is not contentious, as far as witnesses are concerned, we just go by it and then go by what is being proposed by the ministry. On that note, I want to thank uh, the, uh, the presenter and the honorable members. Thank you. Thank you, honorable member for Banjul North. Honorable member for Sarah Kunda, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. The consultative exercise helps the population to know what the Assembly is doing. And that is what laws are meant to do. They are meant to guide society, preventing what harms them, promoting what serves them, and prohibiting what harms them, and uh, ensuring that uh, it protects what serves them. So essentially, the promotional and protection dimension is what has given rise to the review of all those laws that may be harmful to the interests of, of, of women and by extension men and the whole so of society. So this particular one is about full age, what constitutes full age. And apparently uh, if he says that once a woman is married, the woman must be considered to be of full age. Uh, apparently, that is not uh, the view of most of those who are consulted, and that uh, age matters, and uh, full age uh, should be properly defined uh, according to law, and therefore, this definition that is in the Act itself, uh, the Gambian Nationality and Citizens Act, uh, must be uh, repealed and to bring it into conformity with uh, the Constitution and other laws, especially the law that says that you cannot get an ID card until you are 18 years. So uh, if, if this provision is uh, there, it means that there will be some ambiguity in terms of interpretation by those who are enforcing the law. So in that regard, the uh, recommendation of the committee is in line with what will serve the interests of women and the national interests. So it should really uh, get our support. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Member for Seracunda is last on my list. If no Honorable Member is coming, then I will call Honorable Minister of Justice. The floor is yours, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I'll just take this opportunity to thank the members of the, of the committee and by extension the entire plenary. There isn't much uh, issues in this regard except for, as the member for Banjul not have indicated, the subtitle of course will change to reflect the current date. Um, other than that, uh, we appreciate the work of the committee and we thank you very much. There is no, no, no much honorable speaker for, for my intervention. Thank you very much. Thank you, honorable minister. May I now call upon the honorable chair to respond or the mover.
to respond to the issues raised on the report. Honorable. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, I think we have to uh, thank various honorable members who spoke in line with, you know, um, ensuring that we don't have the old laws, because these laws are so much discriminatory and they are not promoting the welf welfare of women. So we thank the honorable members of this house in, in solidarity with us to ensure that we eliminate all forms of discrimination against women. Thank you. Now put the question. Be it resolved that this August Assembly do adopt the report of Select Committee on Health, Women, Children, Disaster, Refugees and Humanitarian Relief on the Gambia Nationality and Citizenship Amendment Bill 2020. Those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those not in favor, please say no. The eyes of it. I thank you. The next stage is consideration stage of the bill is now scheduled as per agenda of the session. Clerk, you may proceed. Report of the Select Committee on Health, Women, Children, Disaster, Refugees, and Humanitarian Relief on the Birth, Death, and Marriage Registration Amendment Bill 2020 by the Honorable Chairperson of the Committee. Thank you, Clerk. Honorable Members, we recall that the motion for the second reading of the bill entitled Birth and Death Marriage Registration Amendment Bill 2020 was moved by the Honorable Attorney General and Minister of Justice. On Thursday, the 16th July, 2020, the motion was seconded and debated on the general merit and the principle of the bill, ensuring accordingly, thereafter, the bill stood referred to the, to the business committee, uh, business committee for ABC committee to the Select Committee of Health, Children, Disaster, Refugees, Humanitarian Relief for scrutiny and report back. The committee today scheduled to table the report before the Assembly. Once the report is tabled, debated, and adopted, the next stage will be consideration stage and will therefore be scheduled accordingly to the schedule. I now therefore invite the honorable care of the Select Committee on Health, Children, Disaster, Refugee, Humanitarian Relief to table the report of the committee. Honorable Care. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, having regard to the same considerations as the, the, the previous report, the Honorable Member for Nyanija, who is also a member of the Select Committee, is being tasked to present this report uh, on, the nation, uh, on the Birth, Death and Marriage Registration Amendment Bill 2021 on behalf of the National Assembly Select Committee on Health, Women, Children, Disaster, Humanitarian Relief and Refugees. Thank you. Honorable Member for Nyanija, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. And uh, thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Honorable Speaker, I move that the report of the Select Committee on Health, Women, Children, Disaster, Humanitarian Relief, and Refugees of the National Assembly of the Gambia and the Birth, Death, and Marriages Registration Amendment Bill be considered. Honorable Speaker, as highlighted by, my, by the previous report from the said committee, uh, members of the 
committee as listed here are uh, Honorable Suman Silla, the chairperson, Honorable Pat Marajawara, vice chairperson, Honorable Sekou Marang, Rapatua, Honorable Suleiman Sa, Rapatua, Honorable Amadou Kamara, member, Honorable Musa Amul Nyasi, member, Honorable Bakari Kamara, member, Honorable Umar Dabo, member, Honorable Kadi Kamara, member, Honorable Neyasi Seka, member, Honorable Mahmoud El Kesane, member, and the Honorable Doros Kausu Jawara, member. Uh, the support staff are uh, Mrs. Sarah Tadbojang, Secretary, and uh, Mrs. Aisa Rusonko, Secretary. Subject matter specialist, uh, Sekou Madiba, SMS, uh, Aminata Elangom, SMS also, and Dr. Ayo Pama. Honorable Speaker, going through the introduction as previous reports and also the acknowledgement, which I will just beg on the indulgence of, of the assembly to skip and go straight. and go straight to the committee procedure methodology, <coughs> the procedure we took. Mandate of the committee, as highlighted in standing order 69, requires the committee not to discuss the principles of the bill, but its details in terms of clauses. If it is thus mandated as follows, list our witnesses, hold proceedings, and take evidence from witnesses. Record the opinion of the committee on each clause and schedule of the bill and apprehend any amendment recommended. Present amendments in order in which they stand in the bill. Present a report, which we are doing today, incorporating the summary of the evidence of witnesses, the opinion of the committee on the clauses, and attach relevant records of minutes of its proceedings. The methodology we took was, uh, since the clause 661B requires a committee at the committee stage at this stage of the process, to engage in detailed investigation when considering a bill committed to it, the select committee called witnesses from identified institutions and organizations. This was after when each of them was provided with a copy of the bill and thus asked to review and present a report, a written report rather, or position paper on their views and recommendations, if any, for the consideration of the committee. After holding the formal meetings at the National Assembly with the stakeholders from government ministries, departments, and agencies, non-government organizations, that NGOs and civil society organizations platforms to represent and discuss their written reports. The committee convened a meeting to review and conclude on the position and validate the report. Going to the committee work proper, as highlighted in the report on page 7, first you go to the bill as entitled the Act was to review and amend the provisions of the Birth, Death and Marriages Registration Act found to be discriminatory against women and girls in the Gambia in furtherance of the Gambia international obligation and in line with, with the Constitution and for connected matters. It was enacted by the President and the National Assembly and the observations and conclusion on that, the committee observed that the witnesses are in agreement with the preamble of the, of the Birth, Death and Marriages Registration Amendment Bill and the committee recommends that the preamble stand part of the bill. Subtitle, <coughs> this act may be, may be cited as the Birth, Death and Marriages Registration Amendment Act 2020. Observation and conclu or conclusions, the committee observed that the witnesses are in agreement with clause one on the subtitle of the bill and the committee recommends us that the clause one on the subtitle stand part of the bill. The other part that was the amendment of the Birth, Death and Marriages Registration Act, 1886. The Birth, Death and Marriages Registration Act, in this act, referred to as the principal act, is amended as set out in this act. Observation on that, the committee observed that the witnesses are in agreement with clause 2 to stand as part of the bill. The committee also recommends that clause 2 should stand as stand, should stand part of the bill. Going further, repeal of section 16, that's three. Section 16 is repeal and replace as follows. The parent of a child to give birth, to give notice of birth within 30 days. One, the parent of a child shall within 30 days after the birth of, a child, of the child give notice of the birth either verbally or in writing to the registrar or deputy registrar of the district or place in which the birth occurred. Two, a person who fails to comply with subsection 1 commit an offense and is liable on conviction to a fine not exceeding $500 or 
O, in default of payment of the fine, to imprisonment without hard labor for a term not exceeding one month. The committee's observation and conclusion on that were, the committee observed that all the witnesses are in support of the repeal of section 16 and its replacement. However, some of the witnesses are proposing a further amendment of the section 16 to by maintaining the fines but removing the custodial sentence and substituting it with using the fine to enable convict acquire that certificate. A witness even proposed for the fine to be $1,000 instead of $500, while another suggest, suggested the fine to be with, be within the range of $2,000 to $5,000. As for the representative of the Ministry of Justice, the custodial sentence cannot be removed. It was also proposed by a witness that the word parent in section 16 be changed to father or mother of a child, as it is too broad and can mean a caretaker. The representative of the Ministry of Justice advised that the imprisonment term, as stipulated in section 16, to be maintained. Recommendation of the committee. The committee agrees with the proposed amendment of stand part of the bill. Four. The repeal of section 17. Section 17 of this of the act is repealed. Observation and conclusion from the witnesses. The witnesses are in support of the repeal of section 17. Recommendation from the committee. The committee recommends for the repeal of section 17 as proposed in the amendment bill. Five. Amendment of section 18. Section 18 is amended by one deleting the words immediately after both father and mother of a child born, the words whether in or out of wedlock. Two, substituting for the words section 16 and 17, the words section 16. Observation and conclusion from the witness. Section 18 was agreed by the witnesses to be deleted as proposed in the amendment bill. Recommendation of the committee. The committee recommends for the amendment of section 618 as proposed by the amendment bill. Six, repeal and replacement of section 19. Section 19 is re repealed and replaced as follows. 19.1, where a child is born to parents who are not married at the time of birth, A, the registrar or deputy registrar shall not enter in the register the name of any person as father or of the child unless at the joint request of the mother and of, the, of that person acknowledging himself to be father of the child. And B, if the person alleged to be the father of the child refuses to acknowledge himself to be the father of the child, the registrar or deputy registrar shall not enter in the register the name of that person unless a paternity order is obtained from the children's court confirming the father of the child. Notwithstanding subsection 1, notwithstanding subsection 1, A, where the person alleged to be father of the child fails to acknowledge himself to be the father of the child, O, B, the mother of the child, the mother of the child does not provide the name of the father the registrar or deputy registrar shall, at the request of the mother, register the birth of the child with the particulars of the mother. Observations and conclusion from the witnesses. The witnesses support the repeal and replacement of section 19, subsection 1. It is also proposed that the registrar or deputy registrar can seek for paternity order from the children's court in the case where the father is refusing to acknowledge himself as the father of the child. Recommendations of the committee. Having reviewed the arguments, the committee recommends for the repeal and replacement of section 19. It further recommends for the insertion of a new provision of section 19, subsection 3, which to read. To read. This is that part is missing. Yeah. Okay, let me skip that. Objects and reason. That's the last part of the bill. This amendment is the first of its kind in Africa for being the trailblazer for the, for the recognition, observation, observance, and domestication of international obligations and commitments relating to women's rights into domestic laws. 
Since the, en since the enactment of the Women Act 2010, significant strides have been made to enforce the law and to protect women in, in line with the provisions of the Act. Section 25 of the Women's Act recognizes the need for periodic review of legislation every 10 years to ensure further compliance with our international obligations as enshrined in the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, that is the set and the Protocol to the African Charter on Humans and People's Rights on the Rights of Women in Africa, the Protocol. This amendment is intended to amend and repeal the provision of this Act of, the, of this act that are discriminated against women as mandated by section 25 of the Women's Act. Observations and a conclusion from the witnesses. The Joint Committee recommends from the, the Joint Committee recommends for the objects and reason sorry, this should not be joined. The, the committee recommends for the objects and reason to be redrafted in order to in order for it to capture the specific nature of the issue the bill is in, intended to address as required by standing order 64 sub clause 1 a which state every bill shall be accompanied by a memorandum signed by the person in charge of the bill obtaining a statement of the objects and reasons of the bill including the nature of the issues the bill is intending to address and also it was agreed by the committee for this tax to re for this tax to be drafting the objects and reason to ensure that it's specific to propose amendments to be assigned to the team of draft passing councils from the Ministry of Justice, or council from the Ministry of Justice. Below is the version of the objects and reason draft, redrafted by the legal draft person of the Ministry of Justice, which the committee recommends for adoption. And uh, that does it. Honorable Speaker, thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Member for Janija, the mover. Any second? Honorable Member for Sabasanja. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker, and thank you, uh, the Presenter. I rise to second the motion. Uh, Honorable Speaker, I just have a few points uh, to raise. This is a very good um, improvement, um, but I have some issues regarding, um, regarding uh, which section again? The repeal of the repeal and replacement of section 16 uh, if i'm right yes <clears throat> yeah honorable speaker i observe that the uh, the committee is making it mandatory for for parents to to to, to notify the registrar or deputy registrar if a child is born in a particular area and uh, it also carries some kind of um, fines or even to the level of imprisonment if convicted. Um, I just want to say to that effect that uh, actually if that is to be taken up, Honorable Speaker, we need to um, also consider um, sensitizing the, po the population because if you look at our, our communities, they are not used to this kind of you know, attitude. So being the case, if this is enacted and adopted, uh, I think, before proper implementation, proper sensitization should be uh, done. That is uh, a concern I have. Uh, the other issue I have is about the, the parent. For example, when a child is born uh, with, with, without, without a parent, for example, without, uh, out, of dead, out of wedlock, now the register is not inside any name, and this, is, this law is trying to eradicate discrimination. For me, if, if, if somebody have given birth to a child and the father don't accept it, the mother don't identify a father, now you, you, you register the child with the particulars of the mother, but the child, the paternity life of the, of the child will not be known. And if that, is, if that persists until the child matures, how would that child feel in the society? I think we should have, um, we should have an alternative to, to, to solve that problem. Um, that is a concern also I have, uh, Ms. Honorable Speaker. I don't know how would we will come with, with, with a solution to that problem. The last point I have is, the last point I have is the, the parents, the substituting parent to father. Okay, uh, th that is very good, but specifically, if, if you want to specify, you can just say father and mother. 
But at certain instances, parents will be very ideal. Because the example I cited here, if for example, a child is, you know, been born by somebody, and there is no father identified, the grandfather of that child can be a parent to that child and can be used as the adopted father. So this is why parent is also crucial here. I don't know what, what is the, how to call it, the rational behind this. Other than that, Honorable Speaker, I only see some little typos, which is not very important. Yeah, but we can, yeah, that, that, is, that is my concern anyway. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Member. I now put the question. It has been moved and seconded that this Honorable Assembly do consider the report of the Select Committee on Health, Women, Children, Disaster, Refugee, and Humanitarian Relief on the Bad Debt and Marriage Registration Amendment Bill 2020. Those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those not in favor, please say no. The ayes have it. Any honorable member who wishes to take part in the debate may do so by raising your constituency card. Honorable member for Serakunda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, honorable speaker. This, uh Amendments appear to be trivial, but they are not. They are not because the Constitution makes certain things mandatory that we are ignoring. If you look at Section 29 of the Constitution, the rights of a child, which also can be found in the Children's Act, it said children shall have the right from birth to a name, the right to acquire a nationality, and subject to legislation enacted in the best interest of the ch children to know and be cared for by their parents. Children under the age of 16 are entitled to be protected from economic exploitation, and so on. But ultimately, save from all forms of social harm. A juvenile offender who is also kept in custody shall be kept separately from all offenders. So age does matter. And it starts with registration of birth, because how do you determine age if birth is not actually registered? So the report is clear, and the bill is also clear, that uh, parents are obliged within 30 days to ensure that they report about the birth of the child for the registrar to register, or deputy registrar. And this is where what the member for Sabasanja said is important, uh, the administration of the act itself to ensure that the facilities are there for the actual registration to take place, to make a law and not provide easy route for the parent to be able to report and get the child registered would be a miscarriage of justice. So the structure on the ground for registration that will not add additional burden of cost to the parents uh, should be found. Uh, secondly, there is a distinction between parent and uh, the mother and child, which the two provisions seek to make. That whilst 
when the parent is known, meaning in a, a marriage setup, then the parents would be responsible for the actual report, depending on the definition of parent. But the second distinction is where the child is born out of wedlock. And that has been a great neglect in that regard. And this is making it uh, very clear that uh, the father should be sought and they could go and make the declaration. And in making the declaration, the name of the father could be captured. But where the father is not known, then the mother will take responsibility of uh, uh, exercising that uh, uh, duty to, to report and get the child registered. So in, in a way, uh, the, the bill is seeking to fill the gaps. And this is what we need to do if we are to progress. As we discover the gaps, then we must pass legislation, no matter how small, how minute, to, to fill the gaps. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Member for Busumbala, the floor is yours. Honorable Member for Busumbala. Honorable Member for uh, Honorable Member for Busumbala. The floor is yours. Steve. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. For, sorry for that. Um, I want to thank the committee. They're doing a good job, obviously. They make work easier for us. Um, but also, you know, as I always say, nothing is perfect in the side of uh, parliamentarians. Anything you brought or you bring, we will have an observation on it. Um, the object of the, of the bill is to do away with discrimination. That is understood. Discrimination against women. But do, do you factor? the mover and the owner of the bill, do you also factor that try to avoid this one can also create another discrimination based on the facilities of the country and the office of the register that you're talking about? First, um, registration within 30 days. I'm thinking of communities in the up country where Access to health center is a problem. Access to these social and public offices is a problem. And you bring a law that within 30 days, they have to register or they face a fine. Yes, you want to avoid eradicate the discrimination on women, but you're also trying to create another discrimination on other people that are deprived of those facilities. I want to know whether during the the, the, the coming of this repeal, is that one considered? For example, the registrar's office. Would the office of the register be available in every community where it will be needed? Is it accessible or would it be accessible to every woman that needs to register a bar? This is my question. Because if it is only going to be Central, uh, centralized in, in the open areas, then those in the rural areas are going to be deprived. Um, the second point is, I want to concur with them and agree to, with that. Um, even in, in, in Islam, where we, the religions are, I believe, when a, when a child is born out of wedlock, unless the man agrees to be the father, but the child is the child of the mother. So there shouldn't be any, any discrimination in that, say. I, I totally concord. If the child is born out of wedlock, and there is no claim or confirmation from any body as a father, I agree that the child should be registered in the mother's details or particulars, because that's the belief I, I have. So other than that, I only want to pop into uh, to agree with that, but also to tell you, to, for, have you considered the other side of discrimination 
or find, making it very difficult for women who are to register their children in deprived communities where the office of the register is not available, uh, easily available to them. Do you think they will be able to meet the 30 days uh, duration for them to meet? Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Member for Busumbala. Honorable Member for Nyani. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, here, I just want to clear my doubt. We are all, we are in the report or in the bill is stating about the registration of the child, uh, about the child's father. But there are inc incidents also which happen. That is, if the newly baby born is found somewhere where you cannot even know the mother, neither the father. So how would that, and somebody might happen to uh, pick it. So where should you fall that registration uh, from the child? So that's my issue, or that's my concern. Because it, it can happen. Though we know the mother has already delivered, but you didn't know the mother, neither the father. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Member for Sami, the floor is yours. Thank you, you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker, for giving me the floor. Honorable Speaker, I also want to thank the committee for a good job that they have done. But Honorable Speaker, if my mind can uh, remind me a lot, during our time, we travel all the way from the provinces to come to Banjun to look for a birth certificate. I know as other speakers have mentioned, if we go to most of the health centers, they have uh, people that are registering those uh, children in order for them to have this uh, birth certificate. But as others have said, if you look at where some of these uh, health centers are, some of the women, they delivered at home. They don't, if they deliver at the hospital or at the health center, it is going to be very easy for them to have access to this. So if you make it as a point of duty, you said within 30 days, they must have this. And if they don't have it, you attack some kind of punishment to it. I think in that, we should look at it. If it is to be done, there should be more sensitization before it comes to be a law. More sensitization. 30 days is too small. That is too small. Even if it is going to be two years. Two years, yes. Because where some people are, it's difficult. Or if they're going to make it a law, let them go around and register those kids. But if you make it as a law within 30 days, if they don't you know, do it, you attach something, maybe an amount of $500 or more, or another punishment. This is the only issue that I have. I think that issue needs to be looked at before it comes to be a law. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Thank you. Honorable Member for Sandu, floor is yours. All right, thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. I also want to join uh, my colleagues uh, on the same issue. Uh, Honorable Speaker, as alluded by some Honorable Members, I only have uh, uh, some few questions. That is, uh, before the traveling of this bill, whether the Honorable Minister get the statistic that's how many children are, were born uh, in hospitals for the past two years and how many children were born in our homes. Uh, Honorable Speaker, like in our area, in Sandu particularly, we have only one health center, that is Diabu. And we have villages who are far as far as 10, 15 kilometers away from the Abu. And there are homes, Honorable Speaker, even a bicycle. They don't have a bicycle. And when somebody delivers there, 
to have access to Diabu Health Center becomes a nightmare. And if um, you pay it at 30 days, so to me, the 30 days is very short. And again, when you look, statistic has shown that in the greater Bandung area, so always when we are making laws, I think we tend to forget about the rural people. And we should not be the case. Gambia is not only Banyul, KMC, or West Coast. We have region beyond that. We have Sierra, you have URA, and we all know the health uh, disparities within those regions. Let's say, example, you go to Same, you go to Wuli. Now, we have villages, uh, honorable speaker, definitely they need health center, and still now for the past 56 years, we are struggling with health disparity. We are struggling with dilapidated health system. So children who are born in their homes, and they can stay for two months on arrival because of mobility, they cannot reach a hospital. There are areas even, uh, we have health centers, sometimes they go for trade, like maybe the honorable member for Nyanija can attest to that. Even you, if you go for trade, those communities, the catchment areas, they find it very difficult even to go and have that opportunity with the nurses to check their child. So now if you pay it at 30, honestly, honorable speaker, people in the rural area will suffer a lot. They will suffer. So, Honorable Minister, if you can extend it, looking at the nature, looking at the, access, at, the, at the accessibility to hospitals, the accessibility is a problem. There are hospitals in rural areas, they don't have ambulance. What they do is, if, if you are sick, you have a, a woman in, in labor, you have to get a horse cart or donkey cart to transport those people, which is very sad. So, my question is, if you have the data before coming with this bill, then that will give us an informed decision. But for 30 days, definitely, if you are trying to help others, you are also discriminating others. In the rural areas, it's not the same as in the urban areas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Member for Sandu. Honorable Member for Lower Salom. No, Honorable Chair, I have withdrawn and wait for the response. Thank you. Lower Salem is the last on my list. Any other honorable? Okay. Kansala, Fonyi Kansala, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, honorable speaker. Honorable speaker, the beauty is that um, no one is disputing the fact that there is need for such a law in place. Just like the honorable member for Serekunda rightly quoted, we are trying to enact what is embedded in the constitution because I believe it is mandatory for every Gambian to know your identity. And one way of knowing your identity is having a document. And there is no document far more important than a birth certificate. Therefore, it's important that all births are registered. I want to, to an extent, agree with the Honorable Member for Sami and Sandu, because they've justified why, to an extent, it will be difficult for this one month time frame to be a law across the length and breadth of the country. Like I said earlier on, they are not disputing the need for the registration, but the concern here is the proximity of certain communities to the nearest facility. I think um, the committee is taking note of it, and we are lucky that the Attorney General is before us with the technicians. So I believe when we come to the last stage, this is where we can discuss to reach an agreement. But the fact that everybody agrees that there is need for such a law in place, I think that will save um, the time that we will spend when, we comes to, when it comes to the last stage of the implementation process or adoption process. On that note, I equally want to thank um, the stakeholders who were widely consulted and uh, by extension, the mover of the motion, the Honorable Member for Nyanija, on behalf of the committee. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker, and I beg to take my seat. Thank you very much, Honorable Member for Kansala. Honorable Member for Nyamina West. Uh, thank you, Honorable Speaker. 
And I would also want to thank the committee for coming up with a laudable uh, bill. It's a good idea, but I want to concur with my uh, colleagues that the URR and CRR uh, MPs uh, for the fact that 30 days, like they mentioned, is very small for those people considering the facilities around um, and also culturally, uh, if a woman gives birth, we all know uh, how do I call this term? Is it incubation uh, within one week or more? Or that's one week or that's even more? So take out one week from 30 days before the christening and other things. And in most cases, these things have been, uh, have been left in the hands of the women. We the men, we know, mostly all these things have been taken care of by the women. So while this woman is inside for one week before christening, and then after christening now, take out one, day, uh, one week uh, uh, from 30 days. So considering the period is too short. And also uh, looking on the health facilities in some areas within the Gambia. Uh, I think we need to take note uh, in that aspect. The other issue is that then why not we tax the health worker, the health officer, who is given mobile, who is given fuel. They used to do it. Early days during my childhood time, time, they used to mobile and register people at their villages, at their communities. They are given the facilities. It's their job. It's, it's the responsibility of parents to register their kids, yes. But it's job given to health officers to go around. They have mobile and so on and so forth, and they are paid the salary. In my own perspective, I think we tax the health officer to go around than saying that within 30 days, we have to meet them for the registration. Thank you so much. That's my own perspective. Thank you, Honorable Member for Nyamina West. Honorable Member for Banjul North, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, this report has generated intense debate, very interesting. I think the presenter will be responding to the concerns raised. But I uh, just want to repeat again that uh, this report was supposed to be presented in 2020. Now we are in 2021. So the, the short title has to change the, the, the year to 21. That is the first point. And the second point is that uh, it is also our duty as National Assembly members, representatives of the people, to ensure that we sensitize the population that this bill seeks to promote a right. Every child must have a nationality. So we must take it as a responsibility to tell our constituents that if every, any child who is born should be registered to protect that right, to promote that right, no child should be childless. Well, of course, as to how to go about it, whether the health workers are going to, should be going around, but I think it is acknowledged by the last speaker that it is the duty of parents to register their children. So we must insist, we must emphasize that it is their duty to do this. Of course, the facilities have to also prepare to be able to ensure that parents are registered. Health workers, the field workers that should be going around to communities when they are doing their rounds, that those who have given birth to children should register them. We're going to the committee stage. There we can do horse trading, but we must also bear in mind that it is our duty uh, to tell the population that they should register the children so that there, should be, there shouldn't be any nationless child in this country. On that note, Honorable Speaker, thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Member for Banjul North. Any other Honorable Member is last on the list? No other Honorable Member. Then let me now call on the Honorable Attorney General and Minister of Justice to respond to some of the issues raised by the honorable members.
Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Well, for the member for Sabah Sanja, you, you, your concern in, on, on one side ended up being similar to the concerns of some of the members of Nyani, Same, Sandu, and subsequently of Nyamina regarding the fear of enforcement of the provisions and the difficulty of implementing it in the rural area. Honorable Member for Sarakunda also had asked for government to make sure um, that facilities are made accessible to people so that you don't make criminals out of innocent people. Of course, yes. Um, when you make laws that have punitive uh, repercussions, I think it's, we have a responsibility. We might not be the line ministry that will be implementing this, but like the member for Banjul not says, by the time we get to committee stage, we would have engaged the line ministry adequately uh, to make sure that um, um, the objective that we tend to achieve, government also comes halfway to meet the citizens in the middle way, so that while the parents are endeavoring to uh, execute their duties, and, and their responsibilities to have the children registered. Government also need to meet them halfway in order on due hardship is not, is not placed on, on, on the poor parents. But of course, these provisions are made bearing in mind the rights of the children as well. So it's, 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 it's a balancing situation. But of course, the intention is never to create criminals out of your folks or out of the ordinary rural people. So I'm quite sure uh, that the provision is there to instill some form of fear in order to induce compliance. But in, in my own thinking, hardly, hardly at this stage, until we get to a point where the facilities are all there and people are reluctant to take advantage of it. I think that's the only time I can see somebody being punished for uh, non-compliance. But where a situation exists where parents will have to walk kilometers to to make sure so these registrations are done, I don't think they will be punished for it. But of course, we have a responsibility, as NAMS, like Member Fubanjul not said, to also help in the sensitization and also present the advantage of such provisions uh, for, 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 the, for the people. Children need to be registered. This 30 days, I don't think is entirely new. It's, it's been in the old legislation. Remember, we are just amending. We are not creating new laws. So this provision has been there. But I don't think you've ever seen anybody being arrested and prosecuted under it. But they are there because people just need to know that um, they have to do these things. We will be mindful of that. We will see how implementation. I, the idea coming from the member for Nyamina is quite interesting. If, if the public health officers in the districts can track their districts monthly and make sure they move with the register, the register itself, which is a book, and go into communities and register as many children as possible and just cut it off and give, it, give them their registration certificates. If this is possible, it, 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 it will go a long way in solving the problem. Now, still on, on, on Sabah Sanyal made mention of whether there is, we can find any alternative to the uh, issue of paternity. I'm not too sure if I understand clearly, but what we are seeking to do under these amendments is, is, is simple and clear. Where a child is born out of wedlock, I think that is where your concern is. There are two scenarios. If there is a voluntary father, of course nobody questions that. So the registration is made and simple. The only problem is if there is a dispute of paternity. If a mother is pointing a finger to somebody to be the father and that person is denying to be the father. Of course, in the absence of a proof of paternity, you cannot impose paternity on a man where there is a dispute and the, 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 uh, the delivery took place out of wedlock. So in that situation, there are other laws that deals with paternity disputes. There is a children's act that deals with that kind of situation. So if they should go to check for paternity and have it confirmed medically and scientifically, then the courts do make orders confirming paternity or parentage. And then such an order can now be relied on by the registrar or deputy registrar to enter the name of the man as a father. But that will be pursuant to a concluded court matter already and a court order is available. 
In the absence of that, this amendment is saying you only enter the particulars of the murder which is known. Of course, this brings us to Nyani. Uh, that raised an issue of where both mother and father is not known. I'm not too sure we have, a, I have averted my mind to that. But it's good that it is coming up at a time before the amendment is passed. We will look into that unlikely scenarios, but it's a possibility. Uh, maybe a child is found. All right. And uh, nobody knows the mo both the mother and the father. And the child is entitled to be registered. To have a child registered is one of their false rights. On in, in which is linked to name, nationality, and other things. So, of course, such a child has to be registered. So, what do we do? Uh, we, will, we will look at that closely. I should believe the Children's Act envisage such found children. So, we will look at it, and we will look at what do we do in this situation, uh, uh, how to register such, such children. Um, Busumbala also emphasized the issue of access. We will bear that in mind. Um, I think the rest of the comments basically are almost the same. Nyani, Sami, sensitization, 30 days too short. Now, the issue of that 30 days, again, when uh, it gets consideration stage, whether it's going to be 30 days, 60 days, uh, at some point, of course, you need to put a deadline. We don't want a child to keep growing without being registered anyway. So whether it's going to be 30, 45, 60, we want it to be this. We don't want it to go into years for a child not to be registered. So we, we, can bo we, we, we will all look at it together. The experts will still be consulted uh, before we can agree on a specific date. Um, so uh, precisely, I thank the committee and the plenary uh, and all the contributions. Um, like Honorable Member for Serekunda said, um, in some of these amendments, you see sometimes we are only amending a section or two. Uh, with respect to specific bills, they might look minute, uh, but in reality, these are huge changes in our law books. And the, that is the reason why our development partners have expended so much resources and expertise to make sure so we search for such uh, discriminatory provisions in the laws and make sure that we, 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 we change them. Member for Busumbala, actually, um, I must add, you made mention of, of a religion, religious position. Um, but I must add, I think I explained it earlier, uh, in addition to what you said, in the Gambia, if there is a court order on paternity, that court order is, is, will, be, will be respected slightly different from the Saria position probably that you said. If, if you refuse paternity in, a, in, in an out of wed, wedlock child birth situation, um, there are DNA tests that can be ordered by the courts. And if these scientific results prove you are the father, the courts will impose paternity on you. And you, that is acceptable in our laws. And you will be the father on record. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Attorney General and Minister of Justice. May I now call on the mover of the report to respond to the issues. Honorable <coughs> Member for Nyanibia. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. And uh, thank you very much, Honorable Minister and all the Honorable Members who made their contributions. First of all, I just want to make a few rectifications and uh, on the missing part, that was the proposed amendment for section uh, 19, subsection 3. It, it's re it reads as the register or deputy registrar can seek for paternity order from the children's court in the case where the father is refusing to acknowledge himself as the father of the child. That's the proposed new amendment that I said earlier was missing. That, besides, as all the honorable members said, uh, first of all, just to know that I'm also from the provinces. Provinces. I'm also from an area which you know that we have difficulties in terms of access to these things. And uh, I have worked in this area. I have been assistant registrar dedicated, based in Kuntaur, actually. I have done a lot of registration in this regard. But I think what members uh, don't understand is the process of registration in this country. 
How it is done is if your child is born, mostly if, if it is at home or at the facility, if it is at the facility, it's simple. You just take the details and uh, make sure so we register him or her. But I can bet, still now, if you go, there are certificates which you know that we register them years back and they are still in the offices. Neither the father nor the mother, nobody will come and pick them. They will be they will lying there. So all these things are issues. So the, the uh, issue of sensitization is definitely very, very key. Where people uh, have concern on this document is when their kids are going to school or you have travel opportunity and so on and so forth. But if you go to villages, you see that they don't even keep these documents in safe places. Sometimes you need a birth certificate. You have to go to the health center and Ross may be registered, registered and again and again. So definitely it's a concern and I think it's the responsibility of all of us to make sure that these issues are addressed because these are, that's the foundation of any document, of any nationality. That's the birth, birth certificate. <coughs> but for like community, there can be also community registrations. For instance, if your child is born at home, which we are discouraging now as health personnel, we want every child to be born at the facility by a skilled birth or by a skilled nurse or a doctor. But if it happens you are born at home, we have these structures there that we need to call the traditional birth attendants, now the community birth companions. Those ones too, they do take these details, take the date, time, and those details to the record. Then whensoever you are going for your routine vaccination, immunization, which we normally do, uh, every month, you take along those details, and these details are inputted in the register, and your child will be registered. All, all these are routes and ways and means. And also, sometimes, as the Honorable Member for Nyamina West said, uh, these health officers also do go on community registration, go out, go out like, for instance, just an example in Nyani, like you go to Nyanga Bantang on a particular day, you sensitize all that area. I'm coming this particular day, to do some community registration. Whosoever that does not have birth certificate, you come over, I register you, then you bring the, all the necessary documents like the alcohol attestation and whatever, then if, the, uh, it, it, if they are registered, on another day you can come back and deliver all these certificates and go away. All these are ways and means. But the bottom line is people are not taking this seriously, especially parents. We are not aware, or I don't know, but Definitely, we need to do a lot of things. Because sometimes back in the early 2000s, in fact, there was a project that UNICEF came up with that every child under five, they have uh, they've put in a huge amount of money and conducted a series of campaigns nationwide to make sure that public health officers go around to communities, to each and every community, register all those children that are under five, free of charge. And still now it is continuing. Any child that is registered under five, you don't pay a budget. UNICEF is taking care of that. I think it's an understanding between them and the Ministry of Health. But still, definitely, people are not coming on board. You only need this when you are grown up, going to school, and you go and register. So definitely, that should change. And I think coming up with these measures, though difficult to implement as the concern of other hundred members, but I think it is a measure that we can take up and see whether we can at least improve on this uh, on the registration of births and deaths, definitely. For deaths, I don't talk about that, because any, any person who died in the Gambia, unless and until maybe you have something in the bank, that's the time you see people coming up for death registration. They don't come. That one is virtually low. In my entire service, for, for nearly five years, I can even count the number of deaths I registered. But for birth, that one is much, but for death, definitely people are not coming on board. So that is it. So. On the concern of the access to facilities in the rural areas, as I said, every facility in the country have, a, have an assistant registrar that is responsible, and this goes down to the various district chiefs and uh, alcalos. What we need is to sensitize our people to take up this and make sure that all these avenues are exhausted and make sure that our children are registered at the right time. I think that is it for the orders the Honorable Minister have responded, like those being born out of wedlock and the concern from my Honorable colleague from Nyani. I think the Honorable Minister have said all that. So on that note, unless I miss any other thing,
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Member, the mover of the report. I now put the question of, be it resolved that this Honorable Assembly do adopt the report of Select Committee on Health, Women, Children, Disaster, Refugees and Humanitarian Relief on the birth and death marriages registration amendment bill 2020. Those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those not in favor, please say no. The ayes have it. The next stage is the consideration stage of the bill. It's now scheduled as per agenda of the session. Clerk. Report of the Select Committee on Health, Women, Children, Disaster, Refugee and Humanitarian Relief on Domestic Violence Amendment Bill 2020 by the Honorable Chairperson of the Committee. Thank you. Honorable members will recall that the motion for the second reading of the bill entitled to Domestic Violence Amendment Bill 2020 was moved by the Honorable Attorney General and Minister of Justice. On Friday, the 17th July, the motion was seconded and debated debate on the general merit and principle of the bill. Accordingly, refer, to the, refer the bill and refer it to the Assembly Business Committee for committee, ABC committee. The said bill to the Select Committee on Health, Women, Children, Disaster, Refugee and Humanitarian Relief for scrutiny and report back. The committee is today scheduled to table its report before the Assembly. Once the report is tabled, debated and adopted, the next stage of the bill, which will be consideration stage, would be scheduled accordingly as appointed date. I will now, therefore, invite the Honorable Chairperson of the Select Committee on Health, Women, Children, Disaster, Refugee, Humanitarian Relief to table the report of the committee. Honorable Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, I wish to inform this August Assembly that uh, the National Assembly Member for Talinding, who is also the Vice Chairperson of the Select Committee, is being tasked to present the report of the Committee on the Domestic Violence Amendment Bill 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Member for Talinding, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I will go straight to the membership of the Committee. Members of the National Assembly Select Committee on Health, Women, Children, Disaster, Humanitarian Relief, and Refugee, uh, Honorable Usman Silab, Chairperson of the Committee, Honorable Fat K. Jawara, Member of the Committee, Musa Ambul Nyasi, Honorable Musa Ambul Nyasi, Member, Honorable Amadou Kamara, Member, Honorable Sheikh Marong, Rapatua, Honorable Kadi Kamara, Member, Honorable Omar Dabo, Member, Honorable Suleiman Saho Rapatua, Honorable Bakari Kamara member, Honorable Ndeyasin Seka member, Honorable Mumudu LK Sane member, Honorable Dauda Kausu Jawara member. Support staffs are Sarata Bojang and Aisatu Sonko. Subject matter specialists are Seh Omar Diba, Aminata Elar Gwam, and Dr. Ayo Palma. Acknowledgement. The members of the Select Committee on Health, Women, Children, Disaster, Humanitarian Relief and Refugee wish to acknowledge the positive response of all stakeholders, institutions from government, non-governmental organizations and civil societies who were invited to participate in the consultation. Their position papers and presentation reflecting their views and recommendations has really enriched the, the exercise and its outcome. 
the participation of the permanent secretaries, deputy permanent secretaries of the relevant ministries, the directors and assistant directors of the concerned department, executive directors and programs, or unit heads of NGOs and CSOs, senior officials, among others, have been very instrumental in the consultation with their ideas and persons to achieve results. It would therefore not be exaggerated to conclude that without their valuable participation and contribution in the, ex in the process, as stakeholders in the promotion and protection of the rights of women and children, it would not have been easy for the committee to complete and present this report for the consideration of the assembly. They provide the evidence or information needed for the conclusion and amendment of the bill. The committee is obliged to express appreciation to the Office of the Clerk for providing the efficient support staff and logistics which enable the committee to carry out exhaustive consultation with all relevant stakeholders. Introduction. After being handed over a copy of the bill entitled the Domestic Violence Amendment Bill 2020 at the plenary on the 22nd June 2020 by the Attorney General and Minister of Justice, the clerk of the National Assembly read, read, this, read aloud subtitle, which was deemed to be the first reading in accordance with Standing Order 65 of the National Assembly Revised Edition 2019. On July 7, 2020, the, the National Assembly Plenary, following the conclusion of the second reading of the bill, which witnessed a debate on, this, on its principle and merits by the Honorable National, National Assembly member, members, referred the state proposed legislation to the Assembly Business Committee, ABC, in accordance with Standing Order 68-1. Consequently, the ABC committee set the said bill for consideration to the relevant consequently, the ABC, sorry, the relevant committee, which is the select committee on health, women, children, disaster, humanitarian relief, and refugee, as provided for the standing order 682. In, an, in accordance with the standing order 682, 69, 1 and, 1 and 2, 97, 1, and 3B, the Select Committee on Health, Women, Children, Disaster, Humanitarian Relief, and Refugee was tasked to review, consult, and report to the plenary its finding and recommendation on the draft Women Amendment Bill 2020. Immediately following the committal of the Domestic Violence bill, Amendment Bill 2019 to the appropriate committee for detailed investigation and report as per standing order 69 to the select committee immediately set itself to work by the convenient a planning meeting to adopt the methodology or approach to undertaking in convening undertaking sorry in order to accomplish the task in accordance with the requirement of the standing orders the committee agreed to hold consultation and do identify the key stakeholders from government and non-government state institutions and organizations to engage to get their views and recommendations on the proposed bill for consideration and composition. its report to the National Assembly. I will skip the mandate of the committee and go to the methodology. Since Clause 661B requires the co a committee at the committee stage of the process to engage in detailed investigation when considering bills committed to it. The select committee called witness from the identified institution and organization. This was after when each of them was provided with a copy of the bill and though asked to review and present, present a written report or position paper on their view and recommendation. If any for the consideration of the committee, after holding the formal meeting at the National Assembly with the stakeholders from government ministries, departments, and agencies, MDAs, non-governmental organizations, NGOs, and civil society organizations and platforms to present and discuss their written report, the committee convened a meeting to review and conclude on the position and validate the report, uh, the report Domestic Violence Amendment Bill 2020, a bill entitled an act to review and amend the provision of the Domestic Violence Act found to be discriminatory against women and girls in the Gambia for, for, for furtherance of the Gambia international obligation and in line with the 
constitution and for connected matters enacted by the president and the national assembly subtitle the act may be cited as a domestic violence amendment act 2020 two amendment of the domestic violence act 2013 the domestic violence act in this act refer to as the principal act it's amended as set out in this act three amendment of section 36 the principal act is amended in section 2 of section 36 by inserting a new paragraph d as follows ensure that the, the rights of the complainant are not prejudiced by an act of court settlement objects and reasons this amendment is the first of its kind in africa for being the trail blazer for the recognition, observation, and domestication of international obligation and commitment relating to women's rights into domestic laws. Since the enactment of the Women's Act 2020, significant strides have been made to enforce the law and to protect women in line with the provision of the Act. Section 25 of the Women's Act recognized the need for periodic review of legislation every 10 years to ensure further compliance with our international obligation act entering in the convention of the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women SIDA, and the protocol up to the African Charter on Humans and People's Rights on the Rights of Women in Africa. This, this amendment is intended to amend and repeal the provision of the act that, that are discriminatory against women as, it, as mandated by section 25 of the Women Act. Planning meeting. The select committee held a meeting on the 29th September 2020 to identify the relevant stakeholders to be consulted to plan and adopt a roadmap for the engagement during the, during the deliberation. Members identified the stakeholders to be consulted from the state and non-state institutions, organizations, example, NGOs and civil societies. The meeting agreed to hold sessions at the assembly with the institution to get their views and recommendations of the stakeholders on the proposed Women Act Amendment Bill 2020 for the consideration of the committee in its report. These consultations are in accordance with Clause 69, Paragraph 2 of the Standing Orders, which states, a committee to which a bill is committed shall consider and take evidence on the provision of the bill and report its opinion they are on to the assembly, proceedings, and witnesses. The following witnesses or stakeholders from government, non-government, government organizations, and civil societies participated in the consultation on the Women's Amendment Bill 2020. Ms. Rohi Bite Dabo, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Women and Social Affairs. Siaka Marong, Minister of, Ministry of Children and Social Affairs. Mr. Kisima Bite, State Council, Attorney General Chambers, and Ms. Ministry of Justice. Fanta Bai Seka, Ministry of Health. Lamin B. Fati, Ministry of Health. Nafi Sisoho Bangura, Ministry of Justice. Ablai Koli, Ministry of Justice. Justice. Mustafa Drame, Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education. Mariama A. M. Silla, Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education. Isaac S. Jalo, Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education. Julde Sise, Ministry of Finance and Economic Affairs, DPS. Adama M. Jeng, Galga. Mariama K. Sanyang, The Girls Agenda. Roya M Namati, Paradise Foundation. Fatu Fai, Paradise Foundation. Aisatu D. H. Sawane, National Women Council. Falu Sow, Network Against Gender Based Violence. Mariama John, uh, Network Against Gender Based Violence. Usman Sisi, Network Against Gender Based Violence. Members of the committees committee in attendance are Honorable Usman Silla, Chair Pazin, Honorable Fatou K. Jawara, Vice Chair, Honorable Amadou Kamara, Member, Honorable Amul Nyasi, Member, Honorable Kadi Kamara, Member, Honorable Ndayasin Seka, Member, Honorable Omar Dabo, Member, Honorable Sehu Marong, Rapatua, Sarata Bojang, Secretary. Consideration and scrutiny findings and recommendations of the committee. In this welcoming and introductory remark, the chairperson commended the stakeholders for responding to the invitation to come and serve as witness. The chair informed the witness stakeholders that the Honorable Minister for Justice and Ta Justice has tabled a series of bills before the assembly, which were commit committed to the Committee of on Health, Women, Children, Disaster, 
humanitarian relief and refugee for further scrutiny and to report in findings and recommendations to the Assembly for consideration and approval. He noted that the Civil Marriage Amendment Bill 2020 was one of the bills committed to the committee, giving a background history on the bill. The chairperson informed the meeting, for, meeting that they are in, in, initially consolidated into one and committed to the health committee, but later withdrawn by the Ministry of Justice, passing in charge of the bill. Subsequently, he said the bill were later separated and brought back to the parliament in June 2020 for consideration. According to the chairperson, the committee is mandated to make relevant recommendations, relevant amendment to the bill, detailing methodological approach of the joint committee in scrutinizing the bill. The chairperson urged that the committee would be inducing evidence, both oral and written from witnesses, to enable it to come up with appropriate recommendation. Furthermore, the chairperson reminded the meeting about Standing Order 101 of the National Assembly, which clearly states the powers and remits of the committees. Consider consideration and scrutiny, oral and written evidence of witness. Minister of Children and Social Welfare. In its oral evidence, the Minister of Women, Children and Social Affairs indicated that as the sponsors of the bill, it is not asking the court not to entertain out of court settlement, but not to compromise the right of the complainant, victim or domestic, of domestic violence. Minister of Justice, the representative of the minister, ministry maintained that the amendment of the Domestic Violence Act is appropriate. They note that the courts are mandated not to pass judgment or make ruling that jeopardize the rights of the victim of domestic violence. Ministry of Finance and Economic Affairs. The representative of the Ministry of Finance and Economic Affairs indicated in both, in both its oral and written position does not object to out of court settlement, but insisted that it should not jeopardize the right of the victim. Ministry of Trade. Should not be there. Minister, uh, National Women Council. The chairperson of the council noted that domestic violence is a lifetime problem for survivors. She said the women have been negotiating, negotiating since time of memorial, adding that they cannot continue negotiating and that it's food to stop. Personal management office, PMO. Sometimes out of court settlement can be entertained as litigation is expensive. Many takes a long time, sorry, may take a long time and lead to family breaks up. There is need for psychologic, psychologic social support, psychosocial support, PSS, for victims or survivors of domestic violence. Network Against Gender-Based Violence. The network supports the amendment. It is dealing with a case of domestic violence in the court. The bill is coming to protect victims of domestic violence who are both men and women. The court to ask victims to express position. Child Protection Alliance, CPA, supports the amendment of laws that are in place, but enforcement is the challenge. The amendment is not disallowed out of court settlement. Cases like rape cannot be settled out of court. Gambia is a signatory of many conventions that promotes the rights of women and protect them against gender-based violence. Paradise Foundation. Part five of Paradise Foundation insists that out-of-court settlement of domestic violence cases should not be entertained as it impacts negativity on the victim or survivor and psychologically traumatize, traumatize the children. She said violence is often repeated repeated and is almost always against women. She calls for mandatory psychosocial support for perpetrators. Summary of evidence. Domestic violence offenses should not be compromised. They should be taken to court. So get some for some of the domestic violence that can be settled at home to be settled in the family level than taken to the court. The effects of the domestic violence are the trauma Therefore, all domestic violence offenses should not be negotiated at family level. For the committee to also consider men in, in this provision, as domestic violence offense involves men too. To involve social workers when escorting the perpetrators to avoid family members' interference. 
So get some for psychosocial support for the perpetrators to come from the community and propose to develop policy on what should be done. Conclusion and recommendation. An act to review and amend the provision of the domestic violence are found to be discriminatory against women and girls in the Gambia. In furtherance of the Gambia, Gambia's international obligation and in line with the constitution for the connect and connected matters. Observation and conclusion. The committee observes that the witness are in agreement with the preamble of domestic violence amendment bill 2020. Committee recommendation. The committee recommends that the preamble stands parts of the bill, the subtitle. This act may be cited as domestic, domestic violence act 2020. Observation and conclusion. The committee observed that the witness are in agreement with clause one on the subtitle of the bill. The, the committee recommend, recommendation. The committee recommends that the clause one on the subtitle stands part of the bill. The amendment of the Domestic Violence Act 2013. The, the Domestic Violence Act in this act refer to, refers to acts, the principal act is amended as set out in the act. Observation and conclusion. The committee observes that the witnesses are in agreement with clause two to stand part of the bill. Committee's recommendation. The committee recommends that the clause two should stand part of the bill. Amendments of section 36. The principal act is amended in section two of, the sec of section 36 by inserting a new paragraph D as follows. Ensure that the rights of complainants are not prejudiced by an act of court settlement. Observation and conclusion. The committee observed that the witness are in support of the amendment. Committee recommend, recommendation. The committee recommend, recommends for the proposed amendment to stand part of, of the Domestic Violence Amendment Bill 2020. Ob the, the committee recommends for the objects and reason to be redraft in order for it to be captured and specific specific nature of issues the bill is intended to address as required by the standing order 641A, which states every bill shall be accompanied by the memorandum and signed by a person in charge. On that note, I beg to move. Thank you very much, the mover. Any seconder to the report? Cantora? Um, thank you very much, Honorable Speaker, for giving me the floor. First of all, I would like to thank the committee for a job well done. And also, I equally thank the Honorable Member for that elucidated presentation of the report to the plenary. Um, Honorable Member, we've, I mean, Honorable Speaker, we've seen the rationale behind this particular bill and uh, if you look at the section the intent to repeal it's all geared towards bringing sanity in our environment and also instill discipline in our society because I am of the conviction that laws are meant to change our behaviors, laws are meant to make sure that one knows where to act and when to act and how to act. And uh, the domestic violence bill, communities face serious challenges in terms of so much intrusion of family negotiation People are seeing fundamental human rights have been violated. But then because of the social nature, perhaps, the religious nature of our country, they tend to interfere and make it um, forcing the victim to succumb to pressure. And uh, these are against fundamental human rights. We've seen people getting up, beating a child, stabbing somebody, a female, attacking here and there. 
But then the family will come and overshadow you, putting a mountain press on you to proceed. However, I would like the mover to extend to me better this legislation because when a crime is occurred, sometimes we appreciate the ADR method to see how best we could negotiate at level of the family. That is the alternative dispute resolution process. Or when an issue is already, is, is already presented to court, the family are pressurizing the victim to take it out of court to settle it. However, the issue we mentioned here about the ADR doesn't really mean that we are trying to discourage this particular provision, but it's also an other best practice recommended in terms of settling the dispute to maintain the unity in our society. Uh, having said that, I would really add my voice that uh, I am in full support of the bill that is brought for us here for a repeal, uh, knowing the number of cases we receive, even at the level of our constituency. So it's, it's also incumbent upon us to also help our community sensitize them a lot. That if you take it for granted that if you, you have so much power or you can beat somebody, and another day your family will come over to negotiate and uh, at the expense of the victim going on those days. So when we keep singing in the minds of people that can help us to deter those um, threats. So basically, I, I, I am in full support of this particular legislation and uh, also call on each and every one of us here. We belong to a community, we come from a community, we represent our people to enlighten them more that gone are the days now, you will take advantage of this issue of out of court settlement. If you do anything that is illicit or that is uh, cruel, you should be ready to face the full, for the full court of the law. I remember, you know, our honorable minister of interior did quote that uh, if you don't want to be a respecter of law, be ready to, to be consumed by those laws. And uh, when the society is now informed that such measures are put in place, whereby nobody can, you know, go free after committing an offense or crime, you know, you, you won't be punished. And this uh, advocates will really help in terms of implementing this uh, provision. So on that note, Honorable Speaker, I want to thank the committee and the mover of the motion for this wonderful uh, uh, draft bill. Thanks so much, Fendot. Thank you, Honorable Member. I now put the question, it has been moved and seconded that this Honorable Assembly do consider the report of the Select Committee on Health, Women, Children, Disaster, Refugees, Humanitarian Relief, on Domestic Violence Amendment Bill 2020. Those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those not in favor, please say no. The ayes have it. Any honorable member who wishes to take part in the debate may do so by raising he or her constituency tag. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Well, it seems that you don't want to see me. But your eyes for yourself forcing you to see me. Madam Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, first of all, I want to thank the, the mover of the, mo uh, of the, of the report. Um, as, as, as the MP of the day, which have best uh, cultural attire. Um, on a serious note, Honorable Speaker, I, I, I want to bring some, some of my observations. Um, unless somebody is calling you. I just want to allow him to. I will remember the floor is yours. Please go ahead. 
Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, the intention of the bill is to eradicate uh, discrimination against women and girls in the society. But I also want, want the, 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 the owner of the bill to also to understand in as, as they're trying to eradicate discrimination, wouldn't they also be creating problems in the society? Um, if you look at the, the intent of society, society formation starts from marriage, and then they give reference to family. And every family, what is more in, important is family to be intact, to have children born. So whenever families are coming together, there is this word of statement and given to the man and the woman that problems are unavoidable, but what is more important, family needs to stay. So I, I want to give this, whether they have put that into consideration, uh, to bring something, to try to eradicate this one, but it can also lead to uh, breakages of families, creating this mistrust within families. If, I, if I'm allowed, I want to explain. Um, first, if you say um, domestic violence, though I am not in possession with the Parents Act, but I, I know it is not, there might be interpretations, but I am I'm suggesting or proposing for a categorization of of, of violence, domestic violence that can go to court. Or that, can, that could go, go to court. But not every sort of domestic violence should go to court because if that is done, one, the process of litigation is, is very tedious, expensive, and then court might not be available, easily available to every society. Uh, to every, everyone in, every, in all societies. Two, it can also create stigmatizations because fingers will be pointed in our cultures. This woman so and so has taken the husband or the brother or anybody to, to court. That's my perspective of, I'm, I'm coming from. So I, I am suggesting if there could be a categorization of what sort of domestic violence cannot be compromised and settled at family level would be easier for us, or me in particular, to say, okay, I can allow this to go. Because I know there are every day in our societies, violence are created between or within families. But most of the time, they are discussed within the families with the intention that they want to keep the family. Because if the woman, for example, is married to a man and there is a problem, when there are no children, they will say, you know, you have to be here. This is culture, this is the, your religion. If there are children between them, problem comes up, even if they want to break, break out, they will say, think of your children, look at the children now. How are they going to be? So in every problem that they have, they try to settle it based on something that they want to keep in place. So that's why I'm, that's my point. That's why I want to suggest, or let me be put through, that in the interpretation of the Parent Act, could there be a categorization of domestic violence that cannot, that the, the law will not allow it to be settled at the family level, but should take it, be taken to court. But in that taken to court also, have we considered, one, the availability of court facilities or court to all, every Gambian at the time that they need it, and also the process and the cost of litig court lit litigations. So, Honorable Speaker, these are my points that I want to be furnished more on them before I give my blessings. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable uh, Member for Busumbala. Honorable Member for Banjul North. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, I would be repeating this unless presenters in indicate it in their presentation to help us that uh, the amendment, the short title, 
should read 2021. Uh, we've had Honorable Member for Busumbala. Uh, what this amendment is seeking to do is, it is not dismissing out of court settlement. I think the Honorable Attorney General Minister of Justice will come and explain. What it is saying is that when a domestic violence case is being settled out of court, it should not prejudice the rights of the victim. If the, the victim is physically maimed, there's an instance that it cannot be settled out of court. The law must take its course. The, the eye of the victim is gouged, or she is handicapped physically. I don't think any elected representative would allow that, would support that to be settled out of court, because the perpetrator is an uncle, or the perpetrator is a brother, or a grandfather, and it is even saying that victims of violence can also be male, a mother, a grandmother. Harming an in-law, so these are the instances that this being, uh, that this uh, is talking about. That it must not, under any circumstance, compromise the right of the victim. It should proceed, and then the course, the court should take its course, and the law should also take its course. So this is what it, uh, what this thing is talking about. Uh, there are. So many instances, as we have been told by the witnesses, who, by the way, uh, activists, even the ministry, that have been dealing with cases of this nature. Sometimes the perpetrator is someone you live with. And every time you're seeing the perpetrator, you know, it's psychologically traumatizing the person. Sometimes they would even come and boast that, yes, I did this to you, and next time I will do worse. Because it has been settled out of court. You're seeing your perpetrator every time, and then the perpetrator is reminding you of how he or she victimized you. That is really traumatizing. So these are the instances uh, that the law does not want to be seen settled out of court. In fact, I cannot see any instance where, personally, being a victim of domestic violence, my conviction is that it should not even be settled out of court. No, no case of domestic violence should be allowed to be settled out of court. This is my personal position. But as I indicated, the law as it is, it's not precluding an out-of-court settlement. But for me, that's my personal conviction. Domestic violence, perpetrators should be taken to court, and then the law takes its course. Thank you very much. Thank you. Honorable member for... Honorable member for Nyani. <clears throat> Thank you very much, honorable speaker. Uh, here, we as lawmakers, the judiciary will always practice what we have already adopted. You go to the local chiefs, they charge you, they say, it's the National Assembly members <laughs> who has already made this law. And here, I have seen a post on page seven and I think that one is most suitable. That is suggestion for some of the domestic violence that can be settled at home to be settled in the family level than taken into court. So I think in most cases, whatever happens in our consequences and it's taken to the police, at the end of the day, members will be called and said, "My." family or my lady or some of my people are at the police 
you have to see how best you can able to settle it. Uh, here it depends on also who is affected. We all know at times such violence are just to threaten the child or the family so that in the event he will not continue to do such things. You see, now we have already live our traditional uh, things which we can able to discipline our children even in, uh, in education aspects. Now children don't bother to go to school. The teacher will be afraid of beating the child. I have seen an incident where a child went to town. She came late. The mother started to wanted to beat her. She, she ran away and she couldn't able to come back home. She went to the police. When she went to the police, the mother has to be called and the mother spent the night at the police until the following day. You see how <coughs> discouraging the mother will be and how effective that child, whether he will be at, again, the mother will also discipline her. It will be difficult and the child will take it as a right or maybe as a free attitude now, he will not do what he's supposed to do. Uh, why not we actually differentiate what type of violence, as Honorable Member for Banjul North said, there are certain uh, violence which are, obviously one cannot bear with that, to leave it like that without mm -hmm. taking it to court. But other issues should be compromised. But in these issues, our local level at this police station's level, they always take the advantage. We will already address the situation at a family level, as a, as a compromise, they said, okay, it's fine. They said that is between you and the family, but now the police also will take in face other cases, will f p pursue the cases. So uh, it should be very, con let's consider the difference, or we, say, we specifically said what are the actual violence we can able to be taken to court. So thank you. Thank you. Honorable member, Woodley East, the floor is yours. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, I think um, the issue we are dealing with is more for the courts to decide. If, for example, a case has arrived at the court, the court should the, the provision is saying the court should look at it to see whether this thing can be settled out of court or it should not be settled out of court. But if it is going to be settled out of court, it should not be at the uh, detriment of the, the victim. I think that's what it is trying to say. Uh, if, for example, you know, a man has beaten his wife, and the wife has gone to the police, the case go, went to the, uh, the, the court. Uh, if parents now opt that the, the case be settled out of court, the court, this law is now instructing the court to say, look at the case. If it is going to go out to be settled out of court, it should not be prejudiced against the right of the, the, part, the complainant. I think that's what the the, 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 the thing is saying. So it's optional. If any time the court will look at it, it's, the court to, uh, it's for the court to decide. If it is too aggravating that the person is lacerated and is wounded all over the body and is now disabled by this thing, then the court will say, no, this should not be settled out of court. It must be, we mo the court will continue. Even if the parents say uh, the case should uh, go out of the court. I think that's what we are looking at. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, honorable <coughs> member for Latakunda Sabiji, the floor is yours. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable uh, Speaker. Uh, honorable Speaker, I think if you look at this uh, amendment that we are trying to do, 
This is, uh, we are also want to be in the same standard, that's international standard with other countries. We all do complain about the human rights. When we talk about women's rights, this is exactly, it's a, this is a part of it. We need to protect them. And the best way to protect our women is to have the right to legal framework in place. And I believe this is part and parcel of it. Honorable Speaker, and in the government here, we have one problem. That is this, one of these Maslaha syndrome that we have in our society. Our girls, women, when we talk about domestic violence, we all know how things are, how things are in our society. Every day, you go to police stations, there's a lot of, there's a series of cases against our women. Then all of a the sudden they will say, let's just settle at the, at the family level. I think, don't, we don't think this is going to hurt. <coughs> so in having this type of a, a law, at least this is going to empower our women. And our, our, we, we also ask men, our, our men as well. Because looking at some, like say, let me give an example of honorable member for Busumbala, <laughs> who is having about four girl child. <laughs> So in order to protect those girls, you know, I think it has to start from us. And it has to start from this National Assembly here. That is to come up with a right framework, the right legal framework that is going to protect the rights of the women in our society. So we are appealing to the honorable members for them to support this. This is, we are on course. If we want to protect the rights of our women, this is exactly what we need to do. The issue of this Maslaha syndrome in our communities, we need to get rid of it. We all have to face the reality. That is it. Thank you very much. Thank you. He's last on my list. Man. Honorable member of Serakunda, please. Yeah, I need to raise my hand. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Well, looking at the comment from the Ministry of Justice, that the representatives of the ministry maintains that the amendment of the Domestic Violence Act is appropriate, they noted that the courts are mandated not to pass judgment or make rulings that jeopardize the rights of the victims of domestic violence. Uh, well, I was looking at the, the responsibility of the court on the section 24 of the Constitution is that any court or other adjudicating authority established by law for the determination of any criminal trial or matter or for the determination of the the extent uh, of any civil right or obligation shall be independent and impartial. So in actually presiding, uh, they must maintain that independence and impartiality. So I'm not really sure whether the idea is to tell the court anything other than providing a law that will ensure that uh, the rights of those who are complainants uh, are not prejudiced by out-of-court settlements. It means that it's a question of, of equity, of looking at what the complainant is entitled to if the court uh, were to preside and make a decision. And what uh, uh, another authority and there uh, are authorities that uh, may be there with the responsibility of helping the court, because not all matter uh, can go to the courts. Otherwise, the courts will be so overburdened and that at the end of the day, time itself will be the actual doer of injustice. So how do you prevent the courts from being overburdened? Uh, then you must have out-of-court settlements, uh, either dispute resolution institutions, etc. But uh, if agreement is, 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 is made and you come to the court and say, well, since we have agreed, we have signed on this, then uh, the court should not go uh, against that. I believe this is, this is where it really matters, that whatever may happen, uh, the court will be the protector of the rights 
of the person. So it is transforming the court into the arbiter and protector of the rights of the complainant. That's the, that is what the, 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 the bill seeks to transform into law. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Member for Sarah Kunda. I now call on Honorable Minister of Attorney General and Minister of Justice to respond to the issues. And Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. I think we need to understand that no form of violence is acceptable in society. That's the take-off point. Violence is not acceptable. Now, and we don't negotiate violence at all. It's just wrong. This specific situation we are looking at is a mischief that is in our society for long, and this House has legislated to deal with that. That is a particular type of violence defined by a setting, and that is domestic setting. Outside of that, we don't even negotiate violence. If you slap somebody in the street, we arrest you and charge you and prosecute you for it. But society has accepted some form of violence to an extent that it becomes a concern for us that we need to legislate to address it. And that is violence that is carried out in a domestic setting. And this House has legislated comprehensively to deal with that. And that is called the Domestic Violence Act, which is already in place. And it has defined in a very wide way what are the different relationships that fit the definition of a domestic relation. It does not only include wife and a husband, son and a father, or parent and children. It could be co-tenants in a house, in a, in a rented apartment. It, could, it, it goes beyond that. It could be a domestic worker and a, and, and a, and, and a master. It, it, it's, it's an extended definition. And a lot of violence do happen in those environments, and our societies has grown to accept them as normal when we don't accept ordinary other type of violence outside of that as normal, but violence that do happen in that setting are accepted as normal. So it's a mischief that Parliament said. You see, I think as lawmakers, I'm sure you know, legislation is always a last resort, and I think that's always understood. It, we only legislate when there is a mischief that all other efforts have been deployed to resolve it, and it's not resolvable. That's the only time when we come here to legislate. So for me, I, I really I, I don't know the, 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 the concerns of those who are even asking us to categorize the category of violence that can go to court and which one cannot go to court. I think the takeoff point should be no violence should be acceptable, irrespective of the setting. So if it happens, it is reprehensible. It should be punishable. Now, all that we are doing with this amendment here is, violence do happen in domestic settings. Of course, they find their way into the criminal justice system, either at the police station level or ultimately into the courts. Of course, they are settled. Like many matters, they are settled. However, don't confuse domestic violence cases with sexual offenses cases. These are two different. Sexual offenses cases, we hardly settle them by, because of their nature. But we're talking of domestic violence, which could, it could be a simple, simple fracas in a, in a, in a setting, but it could, be, it could be a serious altercation as well. So if such a case is to be settled. All that we are saying here, whatever form of out-of-court settlement it will take place, is to take place, must not compromise the rights of the victim. For me, what comes to mind, the first thing is, settlement must not be imposed on the victim. It must be his free use or her free will. For me, that is the first right that should be protected. Because whenever you hear settlement, it must be voluntary. So if we are going to withdraw the matter from the court, Probably we are asking the court to be a bit vigilant because sometimes some of these out-of-court settlements are reached and the agreement is filed before the court for adoption. In that situation, the court needs to look at the terms and probably even find out from the victim 
do you actually agree to this? Is this you? For just confirmation purpose. So that somebody is not coercing the victim or threatening him even for the outside to compel the victim to agree. In fact, that will be, you are even compounding the violations now. And these things do happen. So it's basically only to safeguard. And, and the provision is being informed by, by empirical evidence. There are situations where victims purport to agree to settlement, and then later those violence do reoccur, and investigations reveal that the earlier settlement was actually, in fact, not done uh, following the free will of the victim. So, basically, all that we are trying to do, that is both the executive and you, the legislators here, is to fight against the menace of violence in society in general. That's the, that's the broad objective here. And then we are narrowing it down to domestic violence, and then we are just further protecting the victims here. Of course, like one of the witnesses' submission that we saw in the report, more often than not, the victims are female in this situation. So therefore, it's coming under uh, women empowerment uh, legal uh, review process but victims of domestic violence can be male, can be children, uh, can, be any, can affect anybody. So categorizing violence as to those that are suitable for court and those that are not suitable for court, I'm afraid that would be very, very difficult. I don't even think we can even start that. Um, all violence are prohibited, irrespective of your relationship or the or relationship between the perpetrator and the victim. And, um, if they have to be settled, we are only saying that the right of the victim in the circumstances must be the primary focus of the settlement. No settlement should be allowed. And I think this provision also creates a situation where if a settlement is purported to have been reached, a settlement that violates the right of the victim, that settlement can be questioned in court subsequently. So when we are settling, we are careful. We settle with full respect to the right of the victim. Because the victim is the complainant here. Everything that we are doing should be driven by the victim. We cannot settle without having the victim in the center of that settlement. So if so happens with this amendment now, if that happens, the victim will have a right to recourse. And that settlement itself can be questioned. This is very important because generally, cases that are settled out of court voluntarily by parties. Generally, the courts don't question them afterwards because they simply treat them as two consenting adults having settled their differences. But with statute now saying the right of the victim should be respected, if any settlement in reach, is, is purported to be reached, if the victim can prove that in that process his or her right was not factored in properly, then the courts will now have the jurisdiction to revisit that kind of settlement to make sure the rights of the victims are protected. Basically, this is all that we are doing. Um, it, on the face of it, it might look simple, but practically it will serve a lot of useful purpose uh, in, in addressing this problem of domestic violence. But please, I beg, let's not even start thinking of trying to think of which violence can go to court and which cannot go to court. Our objective should be to discourage violence as much as we possibly can in our society. It's just not acceptable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Minister, Attorney General, Minister of Justice. May I now call on the mover to respond to the issues raised by the Honorable Thank Member in the, in the report. Thank you very much. I will start with the Honorable Member for Cantora, who spoke on the uh, bill and also said that sometimes religious and cultural barrier uh, may be interfere and can lead to the victim to be suppressed. Member for Busumbala also spoke on the motion and he said if we want to totally eradicate uh, or discriminate, uh, totally eradicate sex, uh, uh, if you want to totally eradicate uh, domestic violence, we will bring another chaos to the community, which I think as a game changer, we all have a role to play. Uh, member for Nyani and Busumbala are interrelated. 
he, he also made a contribution and also highlighted that we should be very mindful of some of these uh, bill, uh, bills. Member for Woolley spoke on the, uh, did it on, the on the bill and highlights the differences between the things that need to be settled in court and out of court. Member, of Lat Member for Latakunda also spoke and supported the bill. Member for Serakunda also cited relevant clause of the Constitution and also explained what the bill stands for. Uh, unless I left out something, and I think the Honorable uh, Minister bailed me out. These are the only things I can remember. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Honorable Member, the mover. Uh, let me thank all the honorable members for the response. Sumbala, I'm not taking your, I'm not taking your anything from you. Now I am on the final stage of this report. Thank you. Thank you. I thank everybody. Be it resolved that this honorable assembly do adopt the report of the Select Committee on Health, Women, Children, Disaster, Refugees and Humanitarian Relief on Domestic Violence Amendment Bill 2020. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those not in favor, please say no. No. The ayes have it. At <clears throat> the, the next stage is consideration stage and the bill will now be scheduled as per agenda of the session. At this juncture, I will now suspend the sitting until 4 o'clock for lunch break and prayers. The session is now suspended. They say we slept in one world and woke up in another. This global tragedy got humans together despite our social distancing. Our nature is taking a break. And giving us a wake up call on what and who truly matters. Look around you. Hold on. Breathe. Count your blessings. Take time for self-renewal. For a better start tomorrow. Soon, life will be back. Meanwhile, let's stand apart together. With one heart. Gambia may be the smallest country in Africa, but it will host the second largest gathering of world leaders in 2022. To successfully host the OIC summit and put the Gambia on the global stage, the government of the Gambia set up OIC Gambia to mobilize resources for the implementation of key development and infrastructure projects on a scale never seen before. 20 new roads will be constructed across the country and the Bertel Harding Highway will be expanded into a dual carriage highway of two lanes on each side from the airport to Sting Corner. All people in the Gambia deserve clean water and a constant flow of electricity. Therefore, an entirely new water system will be constructed, including new transmission and distribution networks to meet the increasing demand. In order to provide a more reliable supply of electricity, the OIC Gambia project will replace and double the capacity of the Nowak transformers and overhead electric cables. We will equip the police with modern apparatus and technical training in an effort to keep the streets of the Gambia safe. By building the largest international conference centre in the region, a five-star hotel with state-of-the-art facilities, first-class mobility services and improving the VVIP experience at the Banjul International Airport, OIC Gambia will position the Gambia as the leading conference destination in West Africa. With our partners in the tourism sector, we will reinforce the preeminent position of our nation, the Smiling Coast, as a go-to destination. 
the OIC Gambia will create strategic partnerships that calls for the involvement of local talent and businesses as a matter of requirement. In short, OIC Gambia projects will create jobs, boost commerce, accelerate growth, improve the urban outlook and lifestyles of many families across the Gambia. So let's support the OIC Gambia as it prepares us for one of the biggest global events, OIC Gambia, building today for a better tomorrow. GSM Star GSM Philippe Promotion Banafina 